Good afternoon to all of you from what is a beautiful day here in Bangkok. It's sunny weather. Last Thursday we had a lot of rain, but today it's a beautiful day. So we look forward to a great webinar session um, this afternoon. I will be chairing and moderating the first part of this uh, afternoon's uh, session. And the second part will be moderated by Marion Fredericks, who will be joining us from the Netherlands. If I may start with a short uh, summary of the previous session. We had last Thursday our first webinar session with a very interesting program lots of presentations and a bit of discussion orienting ourselves to the fall army worm in terms of understanding what it is understanding the ecology of it understanding how best to do monitoring and think about early warning systems think about best options for management putting biocontrol first and understanding how best to make sure that farmers and extension workers and government agencies are prepared to deal with the fall armyworm incursions in their country. And for that, we had a whole afternoon of presentations. We started after a short introduction by Maru Chatiket and Yubak on behalf of Thai Education Foundation and FAO. We started uh, with a wonderful um, upbeat presentation from Chris Wickhouse, um, joining us from Hanoi with an overview uh, and a regional status report of the full army worm, um, reminding us what IPM is all about and a very exciting outlook in terms of biologic control options here in Asia, and that we can and should manage full army worm primarily based on an ecological approach in which biological control is very center stage in our approaches. We then moved to FEO headquarters in Rome, where Buyong Hadi, who is the IPM uh, agricultural officer in headquarters introduce us to the FAO full armyworm global action plan, particularly with a focus on what's planned for Asia. The global action plan has ambitious targets. First of all, helping countries to prevent incursions there where incursions have not taken place as of yet. And secondly, most importantly, helping countries to reduce yield loss as a result of full army worm. And um, showing um, that the global action plan um, and com comprises um, a whole range of actions at global, regional and national level and with uh, pilot countries eight around the world, that um, um, demonstration countries eight around the world, where um, FAO will be helping demonstrate best practice management uh, for fall army one. And here in the region, these three countries are India, China, and Philippines. Subsequently, we we had a short introduction on the Fall Mills um, global uh, platform, which is a um, global platform that helps um, analyze data, helps developing systems for early warning systems. It has a global platform, but it also has works through a mobile phone based um, applications through which you can do surveys field surveys, but also enter data based on catches of uh, uh, pheromone traps. And that helps build um, at various levels uh, a clear picture 
of uh, the full army worm situation uh, around the world. And I recommend to everybody who is interested in the details to look at his uh, presentation to understand better about this um, uh, full early warning system application that FAO is making available. And then as a final uh, session for um, that block of presentations on the introduction of full army worm, um, we listened to a short presentation delivered by Alison Watson, representing Grow Asia, but delivering her presentation on behalf of uh, Dr. Bui Shuan Pong from uh, March in Vietnam. And uh, she gave us a short presentation on the Asian Coal Action Plan, um, which is an ambition plan specifically made for the Asian region to address the full army worm incursions and help countries uh, prepare for um, um, good management of the full army worm. Uh, very central um, in their work is uh, information exchange and helping countries among other things, uh, understand uh, biological control through a range of webinar uh, sessions, uh, which I'll talk a bit later about when we get to that point. So that was the first uh, block of presentation. And then we continued with a second block of uh, presentations um, where we went specifically to three uh, countries in the region um, that are appointed as demonstration countries to show best practices. And we went first of all to uh, the Philippines where Wilma Quaterna uh, introduced uh, the Philippine National Plan for Full Army Worm. Um, a range of um, activities are going on in that country in terms of um, uh, training, in terms of um, information exchange in terms of underground testing out effective full army worm monitoring early warning systems and, and management practices. Um, and that was followed by a short presentation by Ivan James Pintukasan, uh, who presented a, a field experience from Region 12 in the Philippines with regards to a local level presentation on experiences. Uh, with regards to implementation of this national action plan. Subsequently, we went to India, where Dr. Bhakta Vatsalam from the Indian uh, Research uh, Network, ICAR, gave us a wonderful and exciting presentation about uh, biological control options. It is um, exciting to see what's happening in India with regards to developing biological control options regards to parasitoids, predators, uh, entomal pathogens, a range of options that are becoming increasingly available to farmers to manage full army worm with a biological control uh, perspective. Uh, so that was a very upbeat presentation, exciting because it basically shows us there is so much available in terms of management options particularly biological control management options that can help farmers uh, manage populations of the full army worm. Subsequently, we went to Beijing, where Dr. Wang Chenying uh, from the China Academy of Agricultural Sciences gave us a presentation on uh, IPM compatible technologies and delivery systems, but basically also introducing their national action plan in terms of what they have been doing in China with regards to creating awareness about full armyworm, the need to uh, prevent spread. And if you have it on farm, uh, what you need to do to be able to effectively manage this. And the Chinese government, in particular Natesk and partners in the province, various provinces, uh, have a, a very active program in place with regards to developing effective early warning systems and developing uh, on-farm management of, uh, of the full army worm. So I would also wholeheartedly recommend everybody to take a look at that detailed, uh, the details uh, and the presentation itself, which will be made available on the 
um, Thai education website, particularly also because we had uh, a bit of struggles with regards to the internet connection with Beijing. So uh, for the details, please refer to that presentation. So we had from these three countries um, a good overview in terms of what the situation is in their countries, what sort of national strategies and policies they have put in place, and particularly also starting to understand uh, how these countries are approaching the prevention, practical prevention and practical management of the fall army worm um, in, in the field. Then we went to back to Alison Watson, who was calling in back from, uh, from, from New Zealand to um, give us a bit of an update, a summary update on the very exciting uh, Grow Asia and jointly with Kabi organized webinar series on fall biological control. These were three webinar sessions that went into the details of biological control. And I would wholeheartedly recommend um, all of you to view these webinar sessions because they provide really good technical background from biological control for fall armyworm in particular, um, with a range of very experienced uh, speakers from around the world who have been working on research and development initiatives and who are experts in their own field with regards to biological control. Um, this, the, the very fact that Grow Asia and Kabi organized this session made the organization of this webinar uh, a lot easier for us because we can focus in this webinar then more on the actual application, the field application of biological control options uh, and for the details, um, everybody is wholeheartedly recommended to view these very interesting um, webinar sessions on biological control. Subsequently, we had a few Q&A sessions, uh, well moderated by uh, Chris Wickhouse, who excellently facilitated the entire day. So with that, um, I hope we have a bit of an overview of um, what featured during the first webinar session. In summary, again, a wonderful sort of status report on fall army worm in the region, uh, understanding uh, what global, regional, and national action plans have been put in place in the various countries, the strategies, putting central biological control options for management of fall army worm. And with that orientation background, we can now move to what we want to focus on today in this second webinar session. And that is focusing on um, uh, getting the strategies and the action plans into the field and implemented and particularly used by farmers. So um, what I did like to do is go with you shortly over the program for today. We have in the first hour, um, hour and a half, um, a couple of presentations. We're starting um, with um, a block that focuses on experiences from selected Asian countries on field implementation of national fall army worm, um, IPM and biological control research and development and training programs. We're starting with a 15 minute presentation to be delivered by Chris Wickhuis from uh, Chrysalis from Hanoi, who will be sharing us with us a summary on the status of fall army worm national policies, management efforts, innovations and capacity building training and implementation challenges from the Asia Pacific region based on a baseline study and questionnaire that um, FAO and Thai Education Foundation sent out to all of the Asia Pacific countries. So Chris will be delivering a summary of the responses we got to that questionnaire. And this presentation will help us better understand what's going on here in the Asia Pacific region, what the issues are and um, the challenges are and how best to move forward. And then we will illustrate in the next three country presentations um, in more specific 
detail giving examples of how national action plans uh, are being implemented in the countries and we will do that um, through a series of presentations from Thailand, from Laos and Bangladesh. It will be a combination of um, short PowerPoint presentations and mostly uh, a set of interesting video presentations, some of these specifically developed for this webinar uh, to have us all understand better about what's happening in countries, uh, what's being implemented in terms of research and development initiatives and, and practical uh, efforts working with extension workers and farmers on prevention and management of the fall armyworm. And undoubtedly, we also will see and discuss a range of challenges with regards to uh, what countries are facing to manage uh, the fall army one. Then if we go to the next part of the afternoon, um, we um, will move to a panel presentation. Next one, please. We will move to a panel discussion to be moderated by Marion Fredericks, uh, which will focus on getting the full army war management strategies out to the field with a couple of questions that uh, will be answered by um, four panel members representing government, uh, CSOs and research and development uh, practitioners. And uh, that will last for about uh, um, a bit over an hour. And then we will shortly wrap up uh, the entire webinar session and looking a bit uh, with regards to uh, preparing ourselves uh, to the final uh, and third webinar session, which is which will focus specifically on training, training of farmers in particular, but also training of extension workers and see where we are and what more needs to be done. And that session will be coming Friday. So. With that, I hope we're all oriented to what will happen today. And with that, I did like to uh, call upon uh, Chris Wickers, who will be joining us from Hanoi with an overview of the responses that we got from the questionnaires and based on surveys that were sent out all over the region and returned over the last couple of weeks and Chris has worked very hard on doing a summary and we're very excited uh, to make this link to Hanoi to have Chris tell us about what the results were of that survey. Chris, can I call upon you to join us from Hanoi? Uh, he shared already. Okay, so as a uh... As Jan already indicated, uh, thank you very much, Jan, for the for the nice introduction. Uh, so I prepared a, a, a fifteen minute presentation on um, basically that that covers a, a summary of uh, national fall army worm mitigation uh, uh, responses, policies, and action plans. So the results uh, basically from from a questionnaire that was sent out by by FAO and the Thai Educational Foundation over the past couple of months. Uh, so I summarized everything and I, 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 I basically have some, some highlights. I, I don't have everything because otherwise this presentation would be far too long and far too detailed, but just some highlights, some elements that I thought were important. Um, so what did I get? Uh, I got a, a responses from 12 different uh, countries in the Asia Pacific uh, region. Uh, uh, so uh, countries including several ASEAN uh, nations, several, several uh, um, Mekong region uh, com countries, um, uh, uh, some responses from Nepal, uh, from Bangladesh, uh, from uh, uh, Papua New Guinea as well. Uh, so I got uh, partial responses from 12 countries, full responses uh, from five countries. So the questionnaire itself was divided in in two parts. Uh, most countries filled in part one, uh, some countries only filled in uh, part two, and, and five countries filled in both parts. Uh, so just some, some highlights, some, some things that, that I felt were, were important. 
Uh, so eight out of 12 uh, countries indicated that there was uh, the presence of a national task force. Um, four out of 12 countries uh, confirmed that there were uh, terms of reference for that national ta task force. Uh, some countries had a very elaborate description of the purpose and the, the focus uh, of, of that task force. So, uh, for example, in Thailand, they, they indicated how uh, the task force was intended to support country level engagement and IPM capacity building, do monitoring and management of alarmy worm, improve IPM policy, tools and knowledge transfer to farmers, implement and or scale up proven effective IPM practices while advancing new and improved control uh, measures. Yeah, so very elaborate, very comprehensive. Uh, other countries had a, a, had a far more uh, uh, succinct uh, uh, description. For example, Myanmar, they indicated that uh, the task force that they had, had established for fall army worm uh, response that was intended to organize national mitigation responses and develop long-term uh, manage, management plans. Uh, yeah. um, the frequency of meetings of, of that task fo force in the different countries varied quite a lot. Uh, in Vietnam and North Korea, they indicated that they had weekly infestation uh, reports on which the government then subsequently acted. Uh, Philippines, Nepal, Thailand, Bangladesh, they indicated that the task force was meeting at a monthly basis. Uh, and then countries such as India or, or, or Myanmar, they indicated that the task force had a high level uh, meeting one or two times uh, per, per year. Most countries, uh, eight out, out of 12 countries, collaborated with national academia to develop, uh, to, to uh, uh, different uh, management uh, uh, options to, to have a closer look at fall army worm ecology, biology, uh, or, or, or spread dynamics. And several countries also collaborated with inter international institutions. For different countries, they, they in, the, in the questionnaire, they indicated that they were FAO. Uh, one country indicated that, that they were uh, teaming up with CIMIT. One country was working very closely together with CABI. Uh, some were uh, uh, executing projects already funded by JIRCA, some uh, funded by USAID, and some had teamed up closely with, with uh, some pesticide companies, some agrochemical uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, major achievements, uh, uh, again, a, a, a varied a lot between uh, the different countries probably uh, de dependent upon uh, national response capacity and also based upon uh, uh, invasion history, yeah, because we cannot forget that in 2018, fall army worm already made it into India, while in 2019, it, it invaded other parts of the, of, of the Southeast Asia region, maybe excluding Bangladesh and, and, and Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah, so North Korea, they said 90% uh, of the IPM plans were uh, successfully or effectively Im implemented. Um, in Vietnam, uh, there was a comprehensive awareness raising, capacity building, area-wide pest surveillance and fall army were mitigation response, really multi-pronged in four different provinces with uh, uh, lower level awareness raising in, in most other pro provinces. The state of awareness of the main stakeholders uh, in Bhutan, Papua New Guinea and the Philippines was termed to be low, uh, while in countries like Vietnam, uh, there was uh, intermediate to high awareness. Communication and extension strategies, very interesting to, to read what the different countries were doing to raise uh, awareness, to, to communicate uh, uh, news about fall army worms. So they were using radio, TV, social media, Facebook, SMS, uh, in, in Thailand, they were using Line. Uh, in other countries, they were using uh, WhatsApp, the, the, a whole range of print media, uh, newspaper, educational video, educational fact sheets, face-to-face -face training also of trainer of trainers and farmer field schools. Um, several countries had a formal communication plan uh, so there vietnam philippines and myanmar had a lot of information on on how they were going about and communicating information on fall army worm uh, so far fall army worm infestation levels and impacts have been described in or have been somewhat assessed in 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 in, in several countries 
fall army worm prevalence uh, again a, a lot of variability variability between the different countries in Vietnam, uh, 4.5 percent of total area of maize production uh, was uh, termed to be or was considered to be heavily infected with with Falarmi worm. In Thailand, that was between 10 to 15 percent of the total area. And in the Philippines, the Falarmi worm was reaching field level incidence uh, on average of 25 percent. Um, uh, Estimated fall army worm induced yield losses. Again, a lot of variability between the countries. Uh, Philippines estimated fall army worm induced yield loss at 2%. Myanmar, somewhere between 2 and 5%. Nepal, around 6%. And then Thailand and some areas of Vietnam, they reported up to 40% uh, yield loss. I, I understand in, in, in high infestation, uh, at, at high in infestation levels in certain. Uh, parts of, of, of their country. Uh, quality loss uh, in Vietnam, uh, um, they estimated about three to five percent of the harvested maize cups uh, contained larvae. Other countries, they indicated smaller cups, they indicated uh, fungal infection in, in, um, in the, the maize ker kernels, and they uh, also signaled a lower degree of marketability of the harvested corn. In terms of farm level economics, most countries they indicated that there was uh, uh, varying levels of, of yield loss and that uh, farm, farm level revenues may have been affected also by uh, an increased pesticide expenditure, especially in Vietnam and Myanmar. Uh, the the, the resp respondents in, indicated uh, high levels of, of, of or increasing levels of pesticide use, which uh, meant with increasing farm, farm level exp expenditures. Monitoring and early warning. Uh, what is uh, being done in terms of monitoring? There's a whole uh, range of, of initiatives. M most countries uh, were using pheromone trapping. Some countries were, were uh, um, uh, investing heavily in field scouting. Uh, some countries confirmed that they were already uh, trialing or implementing uh, the famous app. They're using online data entry forms, national surveillance reporting. Um, some countries had a, 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 a full repertoire of, of, of monitoring tools, such as India, uh, while other countries were still in, in the process of devel developing uh, their, their monitoring uh, approach. Uh, this is especially uh, the case for PNG, for Papua New Guinea, where the fall army worm just arrived uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, only two out of 12 countries had GIS-based mapping. Um, then other information on, 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 the, on, on the fall army worm management response itself. It's a, a presence of a national focal point. Most countries had a national focal point. I think 11 out of 12 countries uh, confirmed that they had a national focal point and one country didn't say yes or no. So maybe there's, there's a national focal point in all the different uh, countries. And then a policy and legal framework that, that uh, that involved a uh, fall army worm of uh, four out of 12 countries confirmed they, that they had a, a legal framework. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of management response, uh, there's a, a very, very interesting for me. It was, it was good to see uh, different uh, uh, local innovations, uh, farm, farmer innovations, or maybe innovations uh, uh, at, at uh, and yeah, in, in academic institutions, at research uh, centers. Uh, so just some innovations that I wanted to highlight, uh, validated push-pull systems in Nepal, uh, the use of vinegar, molasses, and sugar traps or sprays in Vietnam and North Korea, uh, the validation of trichogramma uh, releases in Myanmar, uh, different types of legume intercropping in India with a whole range of, of legumes, red gram, beans, pigeon pea, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, different ways to use beneficial fungi and uh, local releases of sting bugs, which was very exciting to, to learn about in, in Laos. Uh, then in terms of training intensity, so uh, uh, farmer uh, education, farmer uh, farm level capacity uh, building, 
uh, the different countries showed different in, in intensities of, 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 uh, of farmer training. So in the graph on the right, you can see the intensity of farmer training in uh, fall army were medication, bioecology, damage and control. And then uh, in red, you can see farm level uh, training on, on IPM. Intensity goes from one to three, with one being extremely low uh, to three being uh, uh, virtually all farmers tra trained or high level of, of, of training intensity. And as you can see, most countries, they, they report either low or intermediate uh, training intensity. And then level of IPM adoption. So far, most countries, they said, yeah, zero to low uh, levels of IPM adoption. Uh, uh, in North Korea, we had uh, almost universal uh, adoption, which is which is very uh, yeah, very nice to see. Um, so, if we look at the fall army war management responses, what I try to do is to visualize uh, each country's uh, management response using the IPM pyramid. As for the people that attended last week, everybody will will remember the IPM pyramid that both uh, Bu Yung Hadi from FAO headquarters as myself uh, here in Hanoi, we, we presented that IPM pyramid. Again, uh, IPM integrated pest management is the deliberate uh, uh, prioritization and active integration of uh, management pra practices in order to bring down pest uh, po population levels in which Again, uh, the, the bottom of the pyramid is the most important, and those are preventative, uh, agroecologically based actions. Uh, IPM always uh, uh, considers pesticides, synthetic pesticides, as the measure of last resort, and biological control and agroecology as the first line of defense. So now if we look for two different countries, and I, I, I brought all the different elements in their IPM plan together, and I visualize those within the IPM pyramid. Yeah, I, I don't specify the countries. I think every country has a very valid uh, uh, a, a, a approach, a very interest, interesting approach, uh, uh, but I don't, I don't specify the exact country. So if we look at uh, country A, um, we see basically two elements in the base of the pyramid, uh, two elements in the middle of the pyramid, and two elements in the top of the pyramid. So if we just look at the, the number of interventions, we don't really have a pyramid. We have maybe more uh, an obelisk, uh, yeah, which, which, is, which is interesting as well. Um, if we look at the basis of the obelisk, uh, uh, we see manual removal of, of egg masses. So, just, so that is mechanical control. And we see uh, three different approaches for biological control. In the middle of the pyramid, we see pheromone trapping and field scouting. And then at the top of the, of the, of, of, of the country's obelisk, we see 11 different uh, active ingredients uh, listed either for seed treatment uh, for application through backpack sprayers uh, or uh, or for drone based uh, application yeah so that's something to think about uh, that, that yeah we we pursue ipm as a pyramid but yeah some countries uh, uh, develop obelisk obelisks um if we look at the second uh, con country again i don't specify the country but i think this country has more of a pyramid yeah so they invest heavily in the preventative uh, approaches the ecologically ecologically underpinned uh, management strategies uh, 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 doing research on crop rotation fertilization soil moisture control push pull strategies how to destroy the crop residue after harvesting they look at tolerant varieties, a quality seed, botanical insecticides, uh, and they also do regular crop monitoring. Still, they, 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 they also consider imidacloprid seed treatment and they uh, evaluate four different or they endorse the, the use of four different active ingredients for, for spray applications. Yeah. Now, if we look at, at the, the type of synthetic pesticides that are being promoted. What I wanted to do is to map them against uh, uh, Paul Jepson's uh, listing of the 10 most ingredients uh, uh, con control. Uh, so that it, the toxicity is, is, is uh, uh, organized uh, 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 for different uh, human and in, in 
environmental toxicity models. So yeah, either toxicity for aquatic algae, uh, toxicity for aquatic invertebrates, toxicity for worms or for pollinators. So these, again, these are the 10 most toxic products, products which we shouldn't use. So I hoped when I was uh, mapping uh, uh, um, the products for the Asia Pacific countries that this list would basically be empty. That most countries, they consult Paul Jepson's uh, list and they say, oh, these are very toxic uh, active ingredients. Uh, um, um, so we, we don't use them. However, I see that uh, two countries or, or, or uh, two countries, they, they endorse the use of Spinozat, four countries endorse the use of Spinitoram, Five countries, they endorse the use of emmamectin benzoate, the second most toxic uh, uh, active ingredient for, for pollinators. Some countries, uh, they endorse parathion, yeah, which is a, a, a highly hazardous uh, pro product. Some pr products, uh, they, they endorse chlorpyrifos. Also, something to take into consideration is that uh, two of those products that are being endorsed by different uh, Asia-Pacific countries, they are banned already in, in the European Union. So one may ask himself why, why in the Western world uh, some product or why uh, products that are banned in the Western world are still being developed in uh, or still being promoted and actively endorsed by the government in developing countries. Yeah, so that, I think that's a country uh, that's a, a question we, we have to keep in mind and maybe give some further further thought. So these products banned in, in the West, but still endorsed in, in developing countries. Chris, can you try to wrap up? Yes, I hear you. Hello. Can you try to wrap up? Uh, uh, I'm almost there. Uh, yeah, I'm almost there. Um, so let, let's have a look at uh, an IPM recommendation of, of one country. So one country, they, they, they recommend to put uh, uh, tablets of chlor chlorpyrifos or methylparathion in the maize whirl um, and apply this uh, pesticides even in the field if pest uh, problems in increase. So again, we need to take into consideration methylparathion extremely hazardous is banned globally, so one wonders uh, why is this being pro promoted. Uh, insecticidal seed treatments it is, is prioritized by several countries. And uh, again, we need to take into consideration that insecticidal seed treatment does not belong in the IPM toolbox. Yeah, it conflicts with multiple core IPM principles. At I hope that nobody in the audience will say, oh, well, Chris, well, so what, who cares? Uh, um, but I, I hope that people will, will think a little bit more and, and will wonder, well, who really benefits from these government recommended recommendations, yeah? The general public may not benefit, the environment may not benefit, the farmer may not benefit. Drone-based applications, uh, uh, several countries, they, they recommended the use of drones to spray uh, pesticides. And so I, I, I listed a couple of questions for the audience just to ponder upon, to, to think about what are we going to spray with those drones? Is it going to be high risk insecticides or is it going to be biopesticides or natural enemies harmless to human and environmental health? When do we spray? Do we spray following in-field monitoring, following the trap captures in our, in our pheromone traps? Do we spray every Monday? Do we spray when the neighboring farmers are not present in the field so they don't have, get hit by the, by the drift? Or do we spray when we are bored in the office and, and feel like playing with toys? Yeah? Uh, where do we spray? Yeah? Do we do targeted applications on the infestation hotspots uh, or do we uh, do blanket sprays? Yeah? And regarding drone-based applications, I think it's important to have a closer look at India's uh, uh, government stance, which a year ago, they have banned all insecticidal spraying with drones. I think this is a very important uh, stance. This is a very, very important decision. On biological control, I'm almost there, Jan. So uh, this is one more slide and then I'm done. Um, so, so does IPM policy cover biological control? Half of the countries, yes. Several biological control agents are under consideration. Trichogramma, Telenomus, Stingbugs, Earwigs, uh, BT strains, Metarisium bovaria. Um, 
And there's a couple of questions to be asked there as well, but I think in the panel discussion, I'll, I'll, I'll pay more attention to, to that. There's uh, many countries uh, uh, emphasize the need for South-South technology exchange and training uh, needs. Challenges, I'll skip that because of lack of time. And I'll go straight ahead to concluding uh, comments. So Falarmi worm induced yield impacts, they tend to be moderate, uh, at, at least for most countries. Some countries in, uh, uh, re report uh, 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 big problems with Falarmi worm. There's an urgent need for farmer education and awareness raising. There's a need for capacity building and surveillance and early warning systems in biological control. There's a huge opportunity here for regional cooperation and South-South information exchange. There's a lot of room for improvement in, in countries' development of IPM program because pesticide-based management prevails. And here, I think there's a lot of opportunities as well for policy change, yeah? Prioritize, we need to prioritize uh, farmer agroecological training, fast track the registration of biologicals, formally insert biopesticides in IRM schemes, take a clear stance on drone-based uh, insecticide sprays and make sure that, uh, or, 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 or also have a clear stance on, on, on insecticidal seed treatment because this does not belong to uh, I, IPM. Yeah, and that's it from my side. Back to you, Jan. Hello, Jan, back to you. Hello. Analysis. Hello. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Chris. Chris. Yes, yeah. Chris, Chris thanks, thanks a lot for a great, great uh, uh, presentation, uh, presentation with really, really interesting analysis of um, the feedback we got from, from the responses from the various countries. countries. Uh, and and particularly, particularly, I think what was interesting is this uh, comparison of approaches between a pyramid and obelix. You alluded to that in the first uh, webinar session. And I think it's recommended for all countries to critically think about whether they're working through a pyramid approach or an obelix approach. And if it is an obelix approach, that they reconsider this. Also very interesting, Chris, I thought was this mapping of the 10 most toxic active ingredients as for the, the good guidance, guidance provided by, um, by uh, Jackson in his published uh, work um, and the challenges particularly that remain here with the Asian region where we see that um, despite all the guidance that FAO puts out in terms of the importance of managing highly hazardous pesticides that we still see examples of these products being used uh, as well as a range of other products where we have serious concerns. So again, it's important for countries to critically reflect on what they're recommending and uh, work towards uh, softer approaches for pesticide use, recommendations if these are needed, and preferably, as we are emphasizing in this webinar, that we focus on a biological control approach first. So, with that, Chris, um, we will see you back uh, in the afternoon panel discussions. And then I'm sure Marion will ask you to give a detailed uh, presentation or uh, introduction of yourself because I forgot to do that. Um, but we're moving now um, to the next presentation, and that is specifically a country example. In this case, it is Thailand the host country of this uh, webinar. When we were uh, discussing the original concept for this workshop, the idea was to host it here in Thailand because there is a lot of active whole army worm uh, prevention and management work in place in this country uh, and particularly uh, very interesting biological control efforts. So uh, particularly with respect to that latter um, part of the fall management work, the biological control approaches, we have uh, now a very interesting presentation from the Thailand Department of 
uh, actual culture extension, where um, Sirot um, will be joining us and uh, share with us a couple of slides, uh, followed by a video specifically prepared for this webinar session to introduce us to the exciting biological control work that's being done here, um, at, uh, particularly at field level, being implemented um, in the field by farmers and through the so-called um, uh, community pest management centers. There are about 800 of these centers in this country, basically managed by farmers to develop uh, biological control uh, products and, and um, do rearing and help farmers get access to biological control options. And uh, Ms. Sirotso and Mani is the DOE officer responsible uh, for the Community Pest Management Center work in the department. So with that, um, I did like to hand it over to Ms. Sirot to give us um, the experiences from Thailand and her department in, in particular. Ms. Sirot, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? No? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the fall situation and control policy in Thailand. Uh, Spodoptera frugipera, or fall armyworm, is a new pest of corn found in many countries, including Thailand. Um, next, please. Um, it was first found in Thailand in 2018 in some provinces of Northern Thailand. Uh, next, please. In 2019, the infested area is about uh, 200,000 hectares. Next, please. In 2020, the planting area of corn in Thailand is about 1 million hectares and the infested area is, is decreased to about 56,000 hectares. Next, please. Um, under the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives, we have two departments responsible for controlling for, which are the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture Raw Extension. The Department of Agriculture is responsible for the research work, while our department, the DOAE or the Department of Agriculture Extension is responsible for transferring knowledge and technology to farmers. Next, please. Yeah, this is our work transferring knowledge and technology to farmers. Next, please. Uh, we have the headquarters in Bangkok, nine regional pest management centers in nine regions, and also the provincial office in every province and district office in every district. Uh, next, please. Our department works with uh, other organizations such as universities and national science and technology department agency and also other academic organizations. Next, please. Uh, the, con the controlling policy for FAR is, of course, uh, using IPM. Next, please. In 2020, we have the budget allocation to our department. And what we have done that you can see from here, this is the demonstration day that we have organized for in, in 50 affected provinces for about a thousand farmers. Next, please. We have also organized the training courses for 2,350 farmers on IPM. Yeah, next please. 
and also the IPM workshop for 130 regional officers. Next, please. We have also produced the, uh, the learning media such as a leaflet, infographic, and poster. And next, please. And this, and also the radio spot. Next, please. And Facebook Live. Yes, next, please. And this is what we have done uh, on the IPM of far in our country that you can see the IPM technology has already transferred that to uh, Thai farmers. And for the next presentation is about the work control activities that done by farmers. Let's go to the video presentation. Sorry for the quick uh, catch up. Yeah. Biological control is using living organism called national enemy to control pest population to the lower level than economic injury level. National enemies are the living organisms called biological agents whose ecological role is to eat or outcompete species known as pests. The national enemies include predators which attack, kill, and feed on their prey, parasitoids which live on or in prey, and microorganisms which cause disease to pests, or biological agents cause death to their prey. In other words, reducing or controlling the pest numbers. There are three types of biological control. The first one is National Reoccurring Biological Control These bioagents already exist in the nature and play important role by controlling pest population to the, to the balance of nature. This type needs conservation to maintain their population. The second one is Augmentation This type is the release of bioagents which are reared are produced to the quantity and quality needed at a specific time. Augmentation requires a production plan, specific method, budget, labor, and time for the production. So it is needed only under the outbreak situation and when naturally occurring bioagents are not enough. There are two general approaches to augmentation. The first one is inoculative release. This type is the release of bioagents at a small number when pests are found at a low level. And the next one is inundative release. This type is the release bioagent at a high number to immediately suppress the pest population. The last type of biological control is classical biological control. This is when pests are introduced at species and there are no local bioagents available. Therefore, imported bioagent is needed. Biological control can be used at an early planting stage or when pests are first detected. It is necessary for farmers to regularly monitor plant health, pests, and national enemy situations of their fields. This data together with weather and environment factors are analyzed to design a suitable control method to use. If there are few pests with a high national enemy population, then let the nature control itself in contrast, when a pest population is high, but a number of bioagents is low, a release of bioagents is needed. 
Biological control is the best method to control for, because this method can be combined with other IPM methods. The naturally occurring biological control of for were found in Thailand. Predators for controlling for, such as sting bugs, earwigs, ground beetles, assassin bugs, and many more. The parasitoids found are egg parasitoids, egg larva parasitoids, larval parasitoids, and parasitoid fly. For the augmented bioagents used to control for, the first one is Bacillus tinctuensis or Bt. It's commercially used in many countries, including Thailand, and is recommended to use to control for. The next one is predatory bugs, sting bugs, and assassin bugs. These are in Hermiptera order, having piercing sucking mouth parts, which inject and release toxin into a worm. The worm then becomes paralysis and dead. The dead worm had thin skin without fluid and unshaped. The third one is earwig. It is an insect in order the Mactella. Its specific characteristic is the forcep like cerci with the end of body. At the end of body, to catch prey and for fighting. Both nymphs and adults feed on many kinds of insects at different stages, like eggs, worms, and other soft body adult insects. Earwigs live in dark and humid soil, under wood bark, stones, or on plants. They normally hunt during night time. They have good hunting ability. They can search for plates even the plates are hiding in plant stems or fruits and can move very fast to catch the plates using their forceps like fur sign. There are many species of earwigs, for example, brown earwigs and ring legged or black earwigs. The lyrics of bioregen is a suitable IPM method when pests are early found and a use of chemical is not necessary. Earwigs is one of the bioagents recommended to use to control for. Release 1,200 to 12,000 earwigs per hectare depending on pest population. Here, we would like to introduce you a community pest management center. Farmers need to learn all factors affecting their production and their profit. They need to make decisions on pest control themselves based on their field information. Therefore, it is necessary to transfer our pest control technology to farmers. The Department of Agriculture Extension is responsible for implementation of IPM and biological control to farmer practice. IPM of four have been implemented to farmer practice through a unit or a center called Community Pest Management Center or CPMC. The activity of the center are it is the learning center for knowledge and technology transfer on pest management, aiming to develop farmers to be self-reliant regarding pest management, drilling and producing bioagents and other necessary materials for farmer members and providing this to others in community. 
field monitoring and early warning to the community members. IPM4 controlling for was put into farmers' practice by using farmer field school approach. IPM should be done at the early step of plantation, starting from land preparation, soil and seed treatment. For example, soil is treated with metabolism and nisoplea to control fall. Use mechanical control to adult insects when they migrate to a field. For instance, using a sweep net, philomon trap, sticky trap, light trap. These methods will reduce the adult population and are also used for monitoring a pest situation. After planting for three to four days, field survey should be done to estimate pest and national enemy populations. The survey of eggs should be done throughout the whole plant. In the case that eggs are found, mechanical control like egg collection can be used as well as biological control by releasing trichogramma, which is an egg parasitoid, at 120,000 per hectare, or more depending on egg numbers. In the case that larvae at 1, 2, and 3 insta are found, earwigs, sting bugs, and assassin bugs can be released at 600 to 12,000 per hectare. If the fall population is very high, spraying with bacillus thingensis or Bt for 80 gram per 20 liters every 4 to 7 days in the late afternoon or herbal extract such as neem can be done. For at 3 to 6 insta stage are usually found when corns are 22 to 45 days and highly damage the corns. Some larvae infest inside a shoot. Under this circumstance, releasing predator, Bt, neem or chemical pesticides should be applied. The field survey should be done before and after each application. If the corns are over 45 days up to harvesting, normally it is the stage that fall hide themselves in the ear of corn and cause less damage. As the corns are high and larvae are hiding in the ear, it is less efficient to use pesticides. The biological control such as earwigs Sting bugs, assassin bugs, and BT is recommended. IPM leads to safe production, giving safe produce and leftover corn store, which can be used for animal feed. Here is the interview of farmers about fall and the control method. Biological control. Reasons of using bioagents, what to use and how to use, their opinions on the efficiency of bioagents. Well, thanks, Sirot, for an interesting presentation and particularly also the video, which gives us an excellent sort of idea of what's happening in the, in the field with all the exciting uh, 
um, training activities uh, ongoing in the field and particularly uh, with regards to the work being done by the community uh, IPM community centers uh, as I said earlier some 800 of these uh, centers uh, around the country working uh, some of them of course not all but some of them specifically oh, stop, stop, stop. farmers with full army worm uh, management and having access to biological uh, control options um, we would now like to uh, move to Laos um, before we do that I did like to remind everybody that if you have uh, questions to ask to any of the speakers please use the Q&A box um, and also preferably uh, let us know who you would like the question uh, to be uh, answered by. So uh, there will be a bit of time for Q&A after all the presentations are done. Um, now we move um, to the neighboring country of Thailand. Uh, we, cross, uh, we cross the Mekong River either by boat or swimming or by a bridge and we go to Vientiane because from Vientiane, Dr. Uh, Peo Pan uh, will be joining us. Uh, Dr. Peo Pan works with the Department of Agriculture and um, works specifically also with the Plant Protection Center on development of full armyworm uh, management approaches and biological control in particular. She has also been um, working in Shenkwang, one of the Lao provinces up north, to work with farmers in very intensified corn production systems to see how best to work uh, on an IPM approach that puts biological control center at the base of the pyramid in Chris's uh, words. So uh, we now move to Vientiane, to Dr. Peo Pan to give us uh, a few slides, introductory slides, followed by a very nice uh, little video to demonstrate what's happening in the field with regards to uh, full armyworm management and IPM implementation in particular. Okay, let me start. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's not only me here to give you a presentation, I have uh, my college from PPC, Pu Kau Tong, also joined me in the, in the presentation. Also, Sid uh, Won from FAO also is good support me in the presentation. So let me start. On behalf of the uh, Lao uh, PDR, today I will give you uh, a little background of uh, what we done for, for army worm. Okay, next. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the first, uh, let me share about the background on for army worm distribution. The maize and sweet corn is grow throughout the country. The area of growing is more than 150 hectares. The main area is uh, in the north as the green point that I show in the map. And for four army worm is the first fall at the end of 2008 in Vientiane province at the uh, yellow point. And for army worm, it quickly accrued uh, Lao PDR in early, to, in early 2019. Next, please. Okay. Uh, so activity, Activity undertaken in Laos. We have the five activity. It's from first we found until now. The first is survey and the monitoring. Second is support the training material. Uh, third, local staff and farmer training. 
for demonstration and faith is family said to a country why there's a corporate between government NGO and uh, INGO to work on survey and monitoring and also we work closely with FAO to survey in the north and also in south of Laos for uh, uh, scooting the, the, the damage of four army worm. Yeah, next please. Okay. Yeah, for the second act, uh, the second activity, we support the training material. In early, uh, we don't have anything uh, in our hands, so we have to translate the brochure from FAO and CMIS. This brochure, uh, this uh, material, this handout is uh, include the life cycle and the management and also the technique for survey. And after that, uh, we have the poster and also the video that support by Lulas for uh, this material. Next, please. Yeah, for the farmer, uh, for the uh, training, uh, what we train to the farmer and uh, local staff, we, uh, after we have the, uh, the training material, we direct to uh, train the farmer. For example, what we, uh, what we uh, transfer the knowledge to them, it's a story of for our mewom, is how it's damaged, a life cycle, and how to manage men. And the second, we taught them uh, the natural enemy, beneficial insect, especially the sting bug. Uh, we taught, uh, we trained them how to react and how to release and light trap for at dawn moth, we make uh, the biological uh, pesticide is the plant extract. Is the, the plant extract we uh, what we talk, uh, what we train to them is depend on the local that we have. For example, neem or kuduji or tobacco. And the last is. Uh, is the chemical uh, pesticide, is the how to use the safety chemical pesticide. Next, please. The first one is the uh, demonstration uh, for the biological control is the metallism anisophia. This, uh, uh, this product is this product uh, was supported by China and where we done? It said we done in Sayaburi province. Next, please. Next, please. And for the, uh, the last activity, what we done is the farmer actually said that we done in Xinhuang province. This activity, we encourage the farmer to do, to involve friends and uh, also collect data and the result of the leases by themselves. Uh, may 
you may familiar when we talk, it's not related to for army wrong, but it's just my if we think about Sing Kuang is the Da is the motive, uh, uh, is the famous for the people. The photo that you see is the activity that we done. Yeah, next, please. Next. Okay, okay, sorry, is uh, my internet is not sustainable. Okay, for the treatment, well, uh, what are the treatment that we done so far? Are the treatment, uh, or the or the treatment we are monitored, um, monitoring the for amiwom at dune by mula trap and felimun trap. Uh, the treatment we have, prime extract, if for example, neem extract, kudu, uh, kudu tea extract, and tobacco extract. Uh, the second is the commercial BT uh, formulation. And detergent, we also try that. The farmer also try detergent, prime oil. And also this, uh, we try palacitoy, is trigo grama and predator sting bag on sweet corn. And kuduji extract, uh, perhaps predator, uh, uh, predator sting bag on maize. We, use, uh, we, we try chicken, uh, lily chicken. And also uh, transplanting technique for just only for sweet corn and some chemical treatment. And also we try to record the different variety and it uh, will be different damage uh, from for army worm owners. Next, please. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, for the conduct trial, we start uh, from uh, early of 2019 in rainy season and also on SweetCon 2020 in dry season. And now is the current, uh, we have one rainy season for me and one dry season for sweet corn try on to lap out. Uh, in the table, you will see just for example of the damage that uh, the volunteer yeah, as a farmer they record for us. We see that the, uh, the product that we use, the two extract, uh, two plant extract, for example, kuduti and tobacco and the kuduti extract plastic bag, the percent of damage is we it cannot show much on that, but for you, for you lot, we can see uh, that we use the kuduti extract and sting bag is more is less damage. Is you can see is just uh, when compare with uh, tobacco and kuduji extract, we can see just only 9.5% of, of you loss. Next slide, please. Yeah, from that be the observation from our activity, we found that from the farmer engagement, the farmer, uh, the model work, the farmer stay in the list of our work. We cannot work this uh, done without the helping from farmer. For the treatment involved to spray in the kuduti and to tobac uh, tobacco extract uh, were effective than, uh, than neem extract. The biological control 
chick can also use food for biological control agent, but chicken is not uh, it's not easy to to control for for example if the uh, may feel is a far from far from the far from farmer homes so maybe chicken will disappear from the field and predator is the most important is the sting bug they have only themselves in the field and also assessing bug is usually the assessing bug will occur late of state of corn but sting bug will uh, present in early in early state uh, for parasitoid pa parasitoid is we found the parasitoid uh, lava parasitoid egg lava parasitoid and and egg parasitoid in the field and for pathogen uh, pathogen uh, pathogen is the metallism is is more effect, also effective to control uh, for amnivorm. From the data is we found is can kill uh, a caterpillar is up to 60%. Yeah. And for IPM technique, uh, actually it's not like, it's not really the full IPM, but we make more than one method to the field. It plant extract and plant lily predator and also the technique uh, transplanting of the sweet corn is for the bed line the farmer they will spray chemical is more that is the four to five time for the life cycle and but we transplanting uh may uh, so we can easily do the number of spray. Hello. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, Pan, could you wrap up, please? Next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, is this that I just uh, show the, the predator and insect pathogens, also the parasitoid that's found in field. Is the egg parasitoid that we found in field is more effective than other parasitoid? Yeah, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what we learned uh, so far from our work, but at least up to plant extract show the promise and are not determ uh, determined to nature to nature. and the second is predator uh, sting bug is also the technique and we can transfer the technique to the farmer a parasitoid is be useful uh, component for the future ipm and next, uh, we still for the four sun, we, we still not understand it occur, but we could not identify. And we also still not know which variety of uh, me and sweet corn is more tolerant to for army worm. And for the four army worm is uh, that we having the four army worm is not mean we cannot grow the sweet corn uh, uh, in Laos. And the last is the IPM of for army worm, but 
IPM of pets on May and sweet corn because the 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 pets that uh, affect to corn uh, in Laos is not only for army worm. Yes. Next slide, please. The last slide. Yeah, uh, we done the activity. We, we could not done the activity without the, the support for many organizations. For example, the Health with Us Lulas, FAO, Farmer Network, uh, that fund by CMIS, and also the special for this uh, work is volunteer and farmer that join our activity. Thank you. Yeah, that's all for my presentation. Thank you, Peopon, for a great presentation. It's lovely to see all that active field work ongoing in, uh, in a beautiful country, which is Lao PDR. Uh, please stay around for the Q&A session and everybody be reminded if you have questions to any of the speakers, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, box and we will take them up, up after the entire presentations are done for the first part. We're now going to move to South Asia and Bangladesh in particular, where um, we will hear from uh, Timothy Kropnik, uh, who is the country manager for CIMIT uh, in Bangladesh, about some exciting uh, full army worm research and development work, um, but also some great examples of uh, video material uh, to help farmers understand about uh, full army worm monitoring uh, and management. Um, Timothy, if we can connect with you, um, I assume that you want to handle it all yourself from there. If any problems, let us know. We will uh, take on the video material from here in the control room in Bangkok. Tim, the uh, floor very, is yours. I'm assuming that you can hear me well, and thank you, uh, Jan, and, and everybody for asking us to presents and giving the opportunity to say a little bit about some of the work that's being done in Bangladesh. Um, to start, I have a very short, um, very, very short introductory presentation to give you a taste of some of the work that we are doing, and that should come up any second. Um, we've had activities in, in Bangladesh that are largely supported by USAID, um, but we work in very close partnership with our governmental partners, and we have a very active fall armyworm task force in Bangladesh. And just to show a little bit of the work that we've been doing over the last year and a half, we've focused very strongly on assisting the Department of Agricultural Extension in deploying awareness raising and training campaigns and at a very large scale. Um, we started this even before fall armyworm came to Bangladesh because we knew it was coming after its arrival in Karnal in India. We started preparing and then we intensified activities into the, the subsequent seasons. We've worked closely with the Extension Department. We've done master trainings for CABI, for National Research Institutes, colleagues from Nepal. We've also worked with FAO programs to train FAO trainers that went on to train a large number of additional um, farmers throughout the country. Um, so far, we think our reach has been that we've essentially reached more than 70,000 farmers with information on fall armyworm and integrated pest management. We are pleased that after our first year of training activities, we, we measured that the Department of Agricultural Extension recommended to farmers to not spray insecticides three times more frequently than they did recommend insecticides as a result of the work that we've done. Um, and we've also just done large scale media campaigns and showing videos um, across the country prior to COVID where we had audiences of, of more than 130,000 farmers. And we're working now, although we're doing it through Zoom because of COVID, we're working now to recreate a lot of these trainings and redeploy them. Um, one thing I wanted to say that's, that's unique to our work is that the, the National Fall Army Worm Task Force, we had discussions with their task force and also with FAO and the task force wanted a monitoring system that was a little bit more detailed and very specific to locations in Bangladesh, um, more so than what's available in, in, in FAMIAS. So we worked with them to develop a customized tool that has been deployed and the extension department uses for monitoring. And in that system, 
um, we are able to not only track data from 755 fields for presence of fall armyworm, but we're able to track population trends and damage trends. And what I'm showing you here is those trends observed over the last season. And this has been very useful and important because in the trainings that we've done, we've worked with the extension department to interpret these data and use these data to help farmers make decisions about what kind of management techniques they will, they will employ themselves. We've also been able to do yield loss assessments from, from these fields as well, and I'm showing you some of the preliminary data of what we believe the yield loss was from our last season. I, I should also say on that as well, uh, although we've put this in place, we're in active discussions with FAO at headquarters about trying to interlace the data sets with FAMIA so it can become widely available, and these data are publicly available. Um, we also have done a fair amount of work around um, fast tracking um, biological control products uh, through registration processes. Normally it takes 20 to 26 months for a pest control product to be registered in Bangladesh for good reason. The pesticides are poison, you need to register them very carefully, one must be cautious. But for particular products around sex pheromone lures and also um, SFNPV, a biological viral pro pro uh, product that can be used on fall armyworm, we were able to accelerate the path to registration to eight months and these products are now widely available commercially within country to farmers. We've also worked a lot with the private sector and it's a funny, um, the private sector is funny to work with because you tend to think of the private sector as promoting pesticides and indeed they do. Um, but private sector and agricultural input dealers are usually farmers first point of contact to learn about fall armyworm and diagnose and get advice. So we've gone in and trained almost 2000 agricultural input dealers and given them moral hazard training on advising pesticides versus management and maintenance of their client base and tried to use that to get better advice to farmers. And we're also working with one company called Ispahani on parasitoid rearing capacity development, pre-booking of parasitoids by blocks of farmers cold chain storage for parasitoid deployment to agricultural input dealers and biocontrol champion campaigns. And we're also able to use the monitoring data that I mentioned for areas that we know tend to be hot spots for fall armyworm within country and mapping over top of that some of these dealer locations so we can advise our company partners where they need to best deploy parasitoids or where they need to de best deploy Fologen SNPV um, and run their advertising campaigns. Now I'm going to shift to the video that I was asked to share. Um, and the video is a, a video that shows you a little about, about, um, about uh, work that we do on scouting within the country and, and advising farmers. A caveat for the video because of Chris's comment earlier on, it does show um, use of seed treatments for early season seed control, but it also couches that within a framework of what we do around, um, around biological control, scouting and advising, and also use of biological, biological products. So I'll play that now. Thank you. And I'll get the sound. Here you go. बर्तमान भुट्टा चाषे अन्तम आशंकार कारण फल आर्म वर्म नाम एक पोका फल आर्म वर्म एक क्षतिकारक पोका जब भुट्टा बाधाकपी तुला टमेटो तमाम आगाछा सह प्राय आशी धरण शस्य आक्रमण और ध्वस कर तब भुट्टा तर प्रिय फसल यमेरिका महादेश पोका हल दो हजार षोलो साले आफ्रिका महादेश दूहजार अठारो साले दक्षिण एशिया विशेषकर भारत एर आक्रमण देखा दे दूहजार अठारो साल नवेम्बर मास प्रथम सप्ताह बांगलेश कृषि गवेषणा इन्स्टीट्यूट बांगलेश गम और भुट्टा गवेषणा इन्स्टीट्यूट कृषि सम्प्रसारण अधिदप्तर करशर उत्तर और पश्चिमांचल जिला समूह एवं आक्रमण रेकर्ड कर पोकाटी कड़ा अवस्थाय गाचर पता और फल खेल थे 
কিরার প্রাথমিক অবস্থায় এদের খাদ্য চাহিদা অনেক কম থাকলেও শেষ থাকে খাদ্য চাহিদা প্রায় পঞ্চাশ গুণ বৃদ্ধি পায় কিরা পূর্ণাঙ্গ হওয়ার আগে রাক্ষসে হয়ে ওঠে এমনকি এক রাতের মাঝে এরা সমস্ত ফসল বিনষ্ট করে ফেলতে পারে আমি গফুর মিয়া আমি ভুট্টার চাষি আগে কোনোদিন আমাদের ভুট্টা খেতে পোকার আক্রমণ হয় নাই কিন্তু ইদানিং কি যেন একটা পোকা এসা আমাদের সমস্ত ভুট্টার খেত সর্বনাশ করে দিত শুধু আমার না এই পোকার আক্রমণে অনেক চাষি খেত আক্রান্ত ফল আমি গরমের জীবন চক্র তাপমাত্রার উপর নির্ভর করে ফল আমি গরম পঁয়ত্রিশ থেকে সত্তর দিন পর্যন্ত বাঁচে পূর্ণ বয়স্ক স্ত্রী পোকা এক হাজার থেকে দু হাজারটি ডিম পারে ডিম ফুটে বের হওয়া ক্রিয়াগুলো পনেরো থেকে আঠাশ দিন পর্যন্ত ভুট্টা গাছের পাতা কাণ্ড এবং পূর্ণাঙ্গ ভুট্টা গাছ হলে সরাসরি ভুট্টার মোচাই ঢুকে ভুট্টা দানা খায় পূর্ণতা প্রাপ্ত ক্রিয়া ভুট্টা গাছ থেকে মাটিতে পড়ে এবং মাটির পাঁচ থেকে সাত সেন্টিমিটার নিচে পুত্তলিতে রূপান্তরিত হয়ে এক থেকে দুই সপ্তাহ অবস্থান করে অপেক্ষাকৃত উষ্ণ তাপমাত্রায় পূর্ণাঙ্গ পোকায় রূপান্তরিত হতে এর সময় কম লাগে পূর্ণাঙ্গ অবস্থার সময়কাল দশ থেকে বাইশ দিন বা আরও বেশি পূর্ণ বয়স্ক ফল আমি বরম স্ত্রী পোকা ডিম পেরে মারা যায় তবে তার আগে বাতাসে ভেসে কয়েকশো কিলোমিটার দূরে চলে যেতে পারে এটি মূলত আমেরিকা মহাদেশের পোকা হলেও দুই হাজার আঠারো সালের শেষের দিকে বাংলাদেশে এর আক্রমণ পরিলক্ষিত হয় এবং বিশেষ করে ভুট্টা ফসলে ক্ষতির পরিমাণ সবচেয়ে বেশি থাকে এই পোকা অনেক ধরনের শস্যে আক্রমণ করলেও ভুট্টা এদের সবচেয়ে প্রিয় ফসল আমার আশেপাশে তাকালে এই পোকার আক্রমণের ব্যাপকতা বোঝা যাবে অধিকাংশ পাতায় পূর্ণ বয়স্ক ক্রিয়ার উপস্থিতি বিদ্যমান এবং ফসলের বেশ বড় ক্ষতির আশঙ্কা করা হচ্ছে তবে আসার কথা বলে বৈজ্ঞানিকগণ রাষ্ট্রীয় নীতি নির্ধারকেরা এবং বিভিন্ন সরকারি ও বেসরকারি প্রতিষ্ঠানের কর্মীগণ এই পোকা দমনের জন্য নানান রকম পন্থা আবিষ্কারে এবং তার কৃষকের কাছে পৌঁছে দেবার জন্য কাজ করে যাচ্ছে এই পোকার আক্রমণ আস্তে আস্তে বিস্তৃত হবে এবং একটা দীর্ঘমেয়াদী সংকট তৈরি করবে তবে এই পোকা দমনের জন্য বর্তমানে কার্যকরী এবং টেকসই সমাধান হয়েছে ফল আর্মি বর্ম চেনার উপায় পূর্ণ বয়স্ক ফল আর্মি বর্ম ক্রিয়ার মাথায় ইংরেজি উল্টা ওয়াই অক্ষরের মতো স্পষ্ট সাদা দাগ থাকে শরীরের পিছনের দিকে একত্রে বর্গক্ষেতের চার কোনার মতো চারটি কালো বিন্দু থাকে জমিতে ফল আর্মি ওয়ার্ম পোকার আক্রমণ হয়েছে কিনা এটা বোঝার জন্য আমাদের সর্বশ্রেষ্ঠ উপায় হচ্ছে পর্যবেক্ষণ করা যেটা কি স্কাউটিং ও বলা হয় আসলে দিনের বেলায় আপনি যদি এই ভুট্টা জমিতে আসেন তাহলে কিন্তু এই পোকাটা সচক্ষে দেখা খুবই মুশকিল এর জন্য এরা যে রাতের বেলায় বের হয়ে এসে বিভিন্ন জায়গায় যে খেয়ে গেছে সেই খাওয়ার চিহ্নগুলো দেখে আমরা কিন্তু বুঝতে পারি যে আসলে পোকার আক্রমণ আছে কি না যেমন আপনার এই পাতার মধ্যে এখানে অনেক ধরনের দাগ দেখতে পাচ্ছেন এই যে পাতার যে দাগ এই দাগগুলার উপরে নির্ভর করে আমরা কিন্তু বলে দিতে পারি এই পোকা কোন ধাপে আছে এই পোকার ক্রিয়া কোন ধাপে এখন ক্ষতি করছে আমার এই জমির মধ্যে যদি আপনার এই ধরনের কেবলমাত্র সবুজ অংশ খাওয়া থাকে এবং যদি দেখা যায় যে এখানটায় কেবলমাত্র একটা কাঁচির দেওয়ালের মতো একটা আস্তরণ থাকে পাতার মধ্যে সমস্ত সবুজ অংশটা খেয়ে ফেলেছে এক্ষেত্রে আমাকে বুঝতে হবে যে ক্রিয়ার প্রাথমিক অবস্থায় এদের আক্রমণ রয়েছে অর্থাৎ ক্রিয়ার প্রথম এবং দ্বিতীয় ধাপের আক্রমণ এখানে পরিলক্ষিত হচ্ছে কিন্তু আস্তে আস্তে এর আক্রমণ মাত্রা বাড়ে তখন কিন্তু বড় পোকা বিভিন্ন জায়গায় ছড়িয়ে যায় এবং তারা মাছ পোকা এই যে মাছের যে পাতাটা রয়েছে সেই মাঝের পাতা বরাবর তারা খেতে থাকে এবং যার লক্ষণ আপনারা দেখছেন ঠিক মাঝের এই পাতা ঠিক এই রকম দাগ আপনারা পরিলক্ষণ করতে পারবেন অর্থাৎ পর্যবেক্ষণের নিয়ম হচ্ছে আমাদের খাবার লক্ষণ দেখে আমরা এটাকে চিহ্নিত করব এই বিশাল ভুট্টার জমির মধ্যে কিভাবে আমরা এই পর্যবেক্ষণটা করব ডাব্লিউ পদ্ধতিতে পর্যবেক্ষণ জমিতে ইংরেজি অক্ষর ডাব্লিউ এর মতো প্যাটার্ন ধরে পর্যবেক্ষণ করুন জমির ভেতরে প্রান্তে নয় এমন পাঁচটি জায়গায় থেমে দেখুন পাঁচটি জায়গার প্রতিটিতে দশটি করে গাছ খেয়াল করুন 
কোন কোন গাছে পোকা দেখছেন আর কোনগুলোতে দেখেনি তা চিহ্নিত করে রাখুন কতগুলো গাছে ফল আর্মি গরম আক্রমণ করেছে তা লিখে রাখুন কতগুলো গাছে আক্রমণ হয়নি তাও লিখে রাখুন এছাড়াও সেক্স ফেরমন ফাঁদ ব্যবহার করে ফল আর্মি গরম পোকার আক্রমণ পর্যবেক্ষণ করা যায় পরিচর্যার মাধ্যমে কিন্তু আমরা এই ফল আর্মি ওয়ান পোকাটাকে অনেকাংশে দমন করে রাখতে পারি কিন্তু কোনো ক্ষেত্রে আমরা যদি পর্যবেক্ষণের পর দেখি এই ফল আর্মি ওয়ান পোকার সংখ্যা অনেক বেড়ে গেছে বিশেষ করে প্রতিদিন একটার বেশি করে যদি আমরা ফেরবন ফাঁদে আমরা দেখতে পাই তাহলে বুঝবো যে আবার এইখানে এই পোকার আক্রমণ অনেক বেশি হয়ে যাচ্ছে বা বেশি হওয়ার সম্ভাবনা আছে যখন গাছ ছোট থাকে বিশেষ করে ছয় পাতা পর্যন্ত থাকে এমন অবস্থায় যদি আমরা গাছের ছোট পোকার আক্রমণ বিশ শতাংশ বা তার উপরে দেখি তাহলে আন্তঃপরিচর্যার সাথে সাথে আমাদেরকে অবশ্যই জৈব বালাইনাশক প্রয়োগ করতে হবে এবং প্রয়োজন বোধে স্থানীয় কৃষি বিভাগের সাথে যোগাযোগ করে রাসায়নিক বালাইনাশক আমাদের প্রয়োগ করতে হতে পারে আমরা যদি সঠিক ভাবে পরিচর্যা করি তাহলে এটি দমন করা সম্ভব জমি ভালোভাবে চাষ দিয়ে সঠিক সময়ে বপন করা ভালো বীজ ব্যবহার করা ছাতি ফসল হিসাবে আমরা লিগুন জাতীয় ফসল গুলো আমরা চাষের সুপারিশ করি ডাল জাতীয় ফসল আমরা পরামর্শ দিয়ে থাকি এবং পরবর্তীতে লাবণশীল দিতে হবে যাতে এ পোকার যখন পুত্তলিতে পরিণত হয় তখন এরা মাটিতে নিচে যায় ওই সময় আমরা প্লাবন সেচ দিলে সেই পুত্তলি গুলা মারা যাবে এছাড়াও সুষম সার ব্যবহার করা এই পোকা দমনের জন্য একটি অত্যন্ত গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিষয় কারণ কোনো কারণে নাইট্রোজেন সার যদি অতিরিক্ত হয় তখন এ পোকার আক্রমণটা বেড়ে যায় জৈব বালাইনাশকের ক্ষেত্রে সবচেয়ে ভালো যে বালাইনাশকটি এখন পর্যন্ত সারা পৃথিবীতে ব্যবহৃত হচ্ছে সেটি হচ্ছে এস এফ এন টিভি অথবা ফাউলিজের নামক একটি বালাইনাশক তবে সর্বপ্রথম বালাইনাশক প্রয়োগ অথবা আন্তঃপরিচর্যা এগুলো করার পূর্বে যখন আমরা বীজটা বপন করব আমাদের বীজটা শোধন করা হয়েছে কিনা সে ব্যাপারে কৃষক ভাইয়ের অবশ্যই আপনারা একটু মনোযোগী হবে বীজ শোধন আমরা কিভাবে করব বীজ শোধন প্রক্রিয়াটা আমরা একটু দেখে নিই বীজ শোধন একটি কীটনাশক দিয়ে আমরা বীজটাকে সুন্দর করে মিশিয়ে নেব যেভাবে আপনারা ভিডিওর মধ্যমে এখন দেখছেন এবং পরবর্তীতে ঠিক এটাই সাত থেকে দশ ঘন্টা পর্যন্ত আমরা রাখার পর সেটা আমরা জমির মধ্যে বপন করব এই যদি বীজ শোধন করে আমরা ভুট্টার বীজ বপন করি তাহলে আপনারা জেনে রাখবেন যে এটা কমপক্ষে আঠাশ দিন থেকে তিরিশ দিন পর্যন্ত এই ভুট্টার গাছে বিশেষ করে যে ছোট চারাগুলো আপনারা দেখছেন এই চারা গাছে কোনো ধরনের ফলার মিয়ার পোকার আক্রমণ পরিলক্ষিত হবে না সুতরাং প্রাথমিকভাবে যদি আক্রমণ আমরা দমন করে ফেলতে পারি তাহলে পরবর্তীতে এর আক্রমণও আমরা অনেকাংশে দমন করতে সক্ষম হব এই পোকার বিষয়ে কৃষি কর্মকর্তা আমাদের ট্রেনিং দিচ্ছে কিভাবে এই পোকাকে দমন করতে হয় আমরা এখন এই পোকাকে আর ভয় পাই না আমাদের ভুট্টা খেত আর ক্ষতি হবে না তাছাড়া অনেক বেশি সমস্যা হলে আমরা কৃষি কর্মকর্তার কাছে গিয়ে তথ্য পরামর্শ নিতে পারবো কৃষি কর্মকর্তারা তারা নিজেরা মাঠে আইসা আমাদের অনেক তথ্য পরামর্শ দিয়ে থাকে কৃষকদের জন্য সবচেয়ে জরুরি পরামর্শ হলো আতঙ্কিত না হওয়া ভুট্টা ক্ষেত প্রাথমিক ভাবে দেখে অনেক ক্ষতি হয়েছে বলে মনে হতে পারে কিন্তু সঠিক ব্যবস্থাপনার মাধ্যমে এই পোকা নিয়ন্ত্রণ করা সম্ভব কৃষকদের এই পোকা চিনতে এবং সমন্বিত দমন ব্যবস্থার উপর প্রশিক্ষিত করে তুলতে পারলে তারা নিজেরাই কোনো রকম ক্ষতিকর রাসায়নিক কীটনাশক প্রয়োগ ছাড়াই এই পোকা দমন করতে সক্ষম হবে সমাধান আমাদের হাতেই রয়েছে এখন আমাদের প্রয়োজন হলো সবাই একযোগে কাজ করে সেটা কৃষকের কাছে পৌঁছে দেওয়া গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ভূমিকা পালন করে চলেছে সিলেট গম এবং ভুট্টা নিয়ে পৃথিবীব্যাপী কাজ করে ফল আর্মি ওয়ান দমনের ক্ষেত্রে মাঠ পর্যায়ে পোকা শনাক্তকরণ থেকে শুরু করে ব্যবস্থাপনা পর্যন্ত বিভিন্ন পর্যায়ে গবেষণা ও প্রচার প্রচারণ বিশেষত বিভিন্ন সরকারি ও বেসরকারি প্রতিষ্ঠানের সম্প্রসারণ কর্মীদের প্রশিক্ষণের ব্যবস্থা সহ অন্যান্য কার্যক্রম চালিয়ে যাচ্ছে এই প্রতিষ্ঠানে এই ফল আর্মি ওয়ান নিয়ন্ত্রণে বাংলাদেশ ইতিমধ্যে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ পদক্ষেপ গ্রহণ করেছে যার মধ্যে উল্লেখযোগ্য হল কৃষি মন্ত্রণালয়ের কর্মকর্তাদের সমন্বয়ে একটি টাস্ক ফোর্স গঠন করা এবং সরকারি এবং বেসরকারি সংস্থাকে সাথে নিয়ে একযোগে কাজ করা এছাড়াও কৃষি সম্প্রসারণ অধিদপ্তরের মাধ্যমে নানা রকম সমন্বিত বালাই ব্যবস্থাপনা পদ্ধতির প্রয়োগ এবং তার কার্যকারিতা পর্যবেক্ষণ করা
So that gives you a, a picture of some of the, the work that we're, we're doing. Um, I want to thank Jan again for reaching out and, and having us uh, present. Um, one other point that I'd like to make is that in addition to this video, we've, we've also made a longer version of it that has a dramatic um, sort of Bollywood style story um, that's more entertaining for farmers to watch. And we try to make our videos in ways that are, that are appealing to our, our audiences. Um, we've also, um, this week we'll be completing a, a quite comprehensive video about the principles of biological control of fall armyworm um, aimed at a farmer audience. And, and um, it uses similar animations to show the, the detailed biological interactions that are occurring and that farmers can, can leverage and, and, and foster in their fields for fall armyworm control. And um, we're very happy that we've been doing that video together with Cabby. Uh, so we were released very, very soon. Um, with that, I'll stop and thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Tim, for a great uh, presentation from Bangladesh. Um, a nice video as well. I think a good example of how to clearly explain certain practices with regards to monitoring for fall armyworm um, and uh, advice for, for management. Um, so thanks very much, Chris, for this, uh, this uh, nice um, introduction. Tim, sorry for this nice introduction on the work in Bangladesh. And I hope you stay around for a few minutes uh, in the Q&A as well. Um, a, a final note regarding the Bangladesh uh, presentation, I thought it was important to notice the collaboration with the private sector. I think that's important, um, particularly also in regards to providing access to biological control options like uh, NPVs, for example, as you're working on in, in Bangladesh. Uh, for everybody also that is listening and in, uh, we also need to remember that some really great innovative work was done in Indonesia that's already 15, 20 years back with regards to farmers themselves uh, collecting uh, diseased uh, uh, Spodoptera, in this case Spodoptera litura, from onion fields and making their own MPV products. It's something I think that we should also explore in our programs on top of um, particularly looking at the, with, uh, with the private sector, how to make available commercial products. But there is also a lot of stuff that farmers can do themselves, as is shown in Thailand. And as I think we need to tap in our previous uh, experiences to, as well to ensure that we also mobilize farmers to produce their own products. So with, with that, I did like to have, um, did like to have um, 10 minutes Q&A before we take a short break. We will show the Lao video during that break. So if you're interested in viewing the video, you can see the video. If you want to take a coffee, uh, go make your coffee before we go into the second part of the uh, webinar session when we have the panel discussion. But first Q&A. I have a couple of questions. So if we could ask all the uh, presenters of uh, the first part in the morning to basically be online. Um, to put your uh, video on so that we can uh, see you. And um, a first question I have here um, is, uh, I think addressed to Tim, to, to Chris, sorry. Uh, it is a question from John Khalid, um, where the question is, uh, it's basically an observation that the incidence in the Philippines appears to be quite high fall incidents, but less yield loss reported. Is there any specific reason for that? Chris, if you want to answer that, otherwise we can um, basically move to Wilma to ask that, but you might have an explanation for that. Chris? Oh, yeah, what, what I did is I just uh, computed all the estimates from all the different countries. So I just transferred the data from the questionnaires to, to my presentation. I, I imagine these are all very rough est estimates. Um, and field level incidents in terms of, of uh, the, the percentage of damaged plants can, can, cannot necessarily be translated to the percentage of yield loss. If you have 30% damage incidents, that doesn't mean 30% yield loss. Um, so 
one, the rough estimates, and two, do not do not uh, transfer the percentages from one category to the next. Yes, um, but I think Wilma probably will have more detailed information and maybe more reliable percentages and, and numbers. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, we will maybe ask uh, uh, Wilma in the next session to maybe sort say something shortly about that. Um, there is incidence. There is also severity, of course, and I think that's that needs to be clear. Whoever is uh, asking the question, responding to it, to understand these concepts and how that incidence and severity translates into yield loss. Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, Chris, before I move to the next question, just a quick follow-up question to you before you move. Chris, if you can come back. Yeah, yeah I'm back. <laughs> um, Chris, there was this uh, poll question uh, earlier on in the webinar session, which was asking how many legs a full caterpillar has. Can you help us out here? Give us the right answer to that question. Help us out here. <laughs> well, six, of course, but it has, uh, uh, so six true legs, but it has some uh, false legs as well. Huh? Uh, Thanks, Chris. Yeah. It has some, <laughs> all, all, You're I don't helping us all out here in the control yeah. room. <laughs> All okay. insects have six legs. <laughs> yes, correct, Chris. Okay, uh, we have a follow-up question um, regarding the molasses traps, and that came through mostly from the Lao uh, uh, presentation, so I assume it's addressed to the Lao panel uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Pail Pan, can you say something about the efficiency of the molasses trap um, and also say something about what parts of used plant parts are used from the kuduchi and the tobacco plants which parts are used dry material fresh uh, fresh material to make um, um, these um, uh, botanicals Beopan, can you help us out on some of these questions say something about that Yeah, Dr. Peopan. Yeah. Yeah, can you help us out with some answers to these questions? Yes, we Yeah, we the question first is for the plant extract. Plant yeah. extract for the kudu tea, we use the stem and fresh stem. For tobacco, we use leaf, dry leaf tobacco. Is, is my answer is make sense? Uh, yeah, can you just repeat what you're using, uh, what plant part you, you're using for the And position? for the second question is related to molar strap. Uh, mm -hmm. For the molar strap, uh, we did, actually we have the ex mm -hmm. we can we can say we can say the answer in the box. So sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see the, the answer from the Muller strap? If we use the the own Muller, it's not it's not work, it's not attract to the four amoeba. And we don't use only the molas, but we we mix with three parts of molasses and two parts of vinegar and one part of water. We make that for. Uh, we make that before we put in the trap. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is my you, answer is Maxin? Sure, and you can add more details if you want uh, directly into the Q and A box. Uh, I also would like to remind uh, yeah. everybody that uh, there's quite a bit of work done on uh, in, in Vietnam on use of baits and, and molasses baits. I think. Um, and Dr. Fong from MART, PPD, has prepared a couple of slides on that. Uh, we don't have time for that today, but we hope to move this to the third webinar session on Friday to have a bit of discussion on that, particularly also because we will be more uh, having practical uh, discussions for trainers and, and capacity building initiatives in that part. 
Um, with that, uh, I'm afraid we're running out of time for Q&A, so I did like to thank all the presenters uh, for their great inputs and their presentations uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Um, and um, we hope you stay around for the second part of the session, which will be um, a uh, plenary um, uh, panel discussion um, to be led by Marion Fredericks. Um, she will be joining us, uh, has been joining us for a while already from the Netherlands. Uh, Marion Fredericks, of course, most of us know her very well uh, from her very active uh, work on the development of integrated pest management systems in Asia and Africa and uh, working with farmers through farmer field school modalities in most cases to help farmers manage their pests and disease problems and dealing with a whole range of other um, issues that farmers are dealing with and using farmer field school approaches to, to address these. So before we go into the panel uh, discussion, we did like to take a five minute break. Um, what we will do is we will show the Lao video. Whoever is interested in Lao video can stay around and watch this. Uh, for others who want to grab a coffee or a tea, or even for some of us, maybe a beer already, uh, please do, but do come back uh, in five minutes uh, from now, because then we will be discussing, uh, starting with the panel uh, discussion. So with that, take a break. We'll show the live video and we will be back. Um, we'll be going to the Netherlands Maastricht in five minutes from now. Thank you. บงฝูงสาลีแมนแมงไม้สตูพืชชนิดหนึ่งที่สามารถทําลายต้นสาลีของทานได้หรือเกษตรทานสูญเสียฝุ่นละปูกสาลีทั้งหมดบงฝูงสาลีจะมีการขยายตัวจากไข่เป็นตัวอ่อนเป็นดัดแด้แล้วกลายเป็นตัวแก่ตัวอ่อนแมนโตกานที่จะทําลายพืชของทานการควบคุมสตูพืชชนิดนี้แมนมีหลายวิธีนอกเหนือจากการนําไส้สารเคมีปรับสตูพืชวิธีการที่ดีที่สุดในการควบคุมสตูพืชแมนการนําไส้วิธีการป้องกันพืชแบบผสมผสานวิธีการที่ดีที่สุดในการป้องกันต้นสลีของทานแม่นกันย่างสำรวจและถ้าจําเป็นก็ให้กําจัดมันทันทีในเวลานั้นทานต้องได้สํารวจทัวไฮสลีของทานควรใช้ยาฆ่าแมงไหม้ที่ปลอดภัยต่อสิ่งแวดล้อมและกําจัดก่อนที่ต้นสลีจะมีความสูงเพียงบาในวิดีโอนี้พวกเขาจะอธิบายฟังเกี่ยวกับวิธีการสํารวจหาบ้งสลีเพื่อให้ทานสามารถหาวิธีป้องกันพืชของทานแบบป้องกันด้วยตัวเองและครอบครัวของทานการสำรวจหมายความว่าทานต้องย่างสังเกตตามไฮสลีและกวดบึงต้นสลีของทานเพื่อซอกหาฮองฮอยจากการถึกบ้งฝูงทำลายตัวอ่อนส่วนหลายแม่นออกหากินในตอนกลางคืนดังนั้นจะเป็นการย่าที่จะซอกหาพวกมันเห็นตัวอ่อนแม่นต้นเหตุที่จะทำลายต้นสลีของทานตัวอ่อนยิ่งน้อยเท่าใดการควบคุมก็ง่ายขึ้นตัวอ่อนที่หาก็แตกออกมาใหม่จะมีขนาดน้อยและเบิงเห็นได้ยากพวกมันจะมีขนาดยาวประมาณ1มิลลิเมตรเท่านั้นดังนั้นทานจะต้องซอกเบิงในใบที่ถึกทําลายทานสามารถหู้ว่ามีบ้งฝูงสลีจากการสังเกตเบิงฮองฮอยการทําลายที่เป็นหูน้อยๆหรือเป็นปองตามใบสลีของทานนอกจากนั้นทานอาจจะเห็นขวายสีส้มซึ่งเป็นสิ่งเสียดเหลือที่บ้งทายออกมาหลังจากการกัดกินใบและต้นสลีเมื่อตัวอ่อนมีการเจริญเติบโตขึ้นจนใหญ่ทานสามารถเบิงเห็นได้อย่างง่ายดายการควบคุมก็จะยากขึ้นนอกจากนั้นเมื่อต้นสลีเริ่มขอส่วงการเจริญเติบโตและเริ่มเป็นมารแล้วตัวอ่อนจะเจาะเข้าทั้งข้างของมารสลีถ้าหากฮอดขั้นตอนนี้แล้วแม่นเกือบจะบอสามารถควบคุมได้แล้วดังนั้นท่านจําเป็นจะต้องเริ่มสํารวจไฮสลีของทานตั้งแต่ตอนเริ่มปลูกใหม่ที่ต้นสลีเริ่มปงขึ้นมาทานต้องสํารวจไฮสลีของทานจนกว่าต้นสลีจะสูงเพียงบาภายหลังต้นสลีสูงเพียงบาจะเข้าสู่ส่วนเจริญเติบโตถ้าทานพบว่าตัวอ่อนบ้งสลีมาฮอดขันนี้ท่านก็บอสามารถเฮ็ดยังได้แล้วเพราะฉะนั้นการสํารวจตั้งแต่ตอนเริ่มต้นปลูกใหม่จึงมีความสําคัญที่สุดในเวลาที่ทานสํารวจไม่ว่าจะเป็นในระยะเริ่มต้นปลูกหรือว่าระยะท้ายของการแตกยอดทานสามารถสํารวจไฮของทานตามหูบตัวดับเบิลยูหูบตัวดับเบิลยูนี้แม่นวิธีการหนึ่งที่จะเฮ็ดให้การสํารวจไฮสลีของทานเป็นแบบซุ่มเอาย่างเข้าไปในไฮสลีของทานเลิกประมาณหาแมตจากขอบของไฮทานสามารถย่างเป็นหูบตัวดับเบิลยูในไฮสลีของทานและไฮยุดยูหาจุดที่แตกต่างกันในเวลาสํารวจไฮควรหลีกเลี่ยงการเลือกแถวที่อยู่ตามขอบไฮ
อยู่แต่ละจุดของทั้ง5จุดทางต้นได้กวดบึงประมาณ10หาซาวต้นเพื่อซอกหาห้องห้อยของการทำลายจากโบ้งฝูงท่านควรบันทึกจํานวนต้นที่ท่านได้กวดเบิงและจํานวนต้นที่พบว่าเสียหายหลังจากนั้นจึงย่ายไปหาจุดต่อไปและสืบต่อเฮ็ดแบบเดียวกันท่านต้องได้เฮ็ดแบบนี้ทั้งหมดหาจุดในไฮของท่านในส่วนระยะเวลาการเริ่มจอยอดตัวบงอาจจะกินใบและเฮ็ดไทใบมีหูและเป็นปองที่มีหูน้อยๆท่านต้องได้บันทึกจํานวนเบี้ยที่เสียหายในหูแบบนี้ถ้าหากพบเห็นว่ามีอย่างน้อยสองใน10ต้นที่ท่านสังเกตเห็นแล้วว่ามีความเสียหายท่านควรปรึกษานักส่งเสริมในท้องถิ่นของทานเบิงวาจะคุ้มค่ากับค่าเสียจ่ายในการกําจัดบ้งหรือบอ่อการสํารวจในระยะท้ายของการจอยอดควรกวดสอบเบิงยอดที่ออกมาล่าสุด3หาสีใบห้องห้อยของยอดที่ถูกทําลายรวมมีใบที่เป็นปองเป็นหูเลมิขวยสิงเศษเหลือของมันที่ยังอยู่ใหม่ๆนอกจากนั้นอาจจะเห็นตัวอ่อนที่ยังเป็นๆอยู่ท่านต้องได้บันทึกจํานวนต้นที่ถูกทําลายใหม่ๆจํานวนซิปหาซาวต้นในจุดที่ท่านไปกวดสอบท่านต้องได้ซอกหายอดที่ถูกทําลายใหม่ๆหรือเป็นหูเป็นปองในเวลากวดสอบถ้าหากท่านพบว่ามีอย่างหน่อยซีในซิปต้นที่มีความเสียหายท่านควรติดต่อหานักส่งเสริมท้องถิ่นเพื่อสอบถามว่าถ้าจะลงทุนกําจัดบงจะคุ้มค่าในการใส้ใจหรือบอ่อบ้งฝูงสามารถควบคุมได้โดยการนําไส้วิธีการป้องกันพืชแบบผสมผสานนักส่งเสริมในท้องถิ่นสามารถแนะนําทานได้เกี่ยวกับวิธีการที่ควรนําไส้รวมถึงการไส้ยาฆ่าเมงไหม้ที่ปลอดภัยต่อสิ่งแวดล้อมเพื่อลดพรผลให้ต่อเมงไหม้ที่เป็นประโยชน์และต่อตนเองและต่อครอบครัวของทานเมื่อสาลีของทานอยู่ในระยะเวลาออกห่วงและเป็นมานการควบคุมบ้งฝูงจะยิ่งยากยิ่งขึ้นเพื่อให้มีความพร้อมท่านควรปรึกษาผู้เซียวซานในท้องถิ่นเกี่ยวกับบ้องฝูงสลีในฤดูกาลนี้ถ้าท่านบุแนเจว่าควรเห็ดแนวไดกับสตูพื้นนี้ท่านควรขอคําแนะนําจากนักส่งเสริมหรือผู้ที่มีความหูด้านนี้เกี่ยวกับการกับจัดบ้องฝูงด้วยการนําไส้วิธีการป้องกันพืชแบบผสมผสานขอให้ทานจือไว้ว่าควรเริ่มต้นสํารวจตั้งแต่เริ่มต้นปลูกและควรนําไส้วิธีป้องกันพืชแบบผสมผสานฮัลโหลนี่คือมาริอันไอ้ยูสูมยูคันเฮียมีและฉันสบายที่จะมาช่วยแบ่งปัญหาที่จะทำให้ผู้ใช้ได้รับคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่เราได้รับจากการตอบคำถามที่
Chin from Cambodia could unmute. Okay, good. Well, okay, I think while we're trying to figure out some of these uh, issues, um, I would like to ask Wilma, Chris, and then Fiorek to shortly introduce themselves, and maybe Andrew will be back by then. Wilma, can you please introduce yourself very briefly? Hello, good day. I am Wilma Quaterno from the Philippines. So I'm working with the Bureau of Plant Industry, Department of Agriculture. Uh, I've been exposed to farmer food school since 1993, which is the famous uh, IPM of the Philippines. And we were able to, do, to train 400,000 farmers. And until now that uh, uh, the really the residue of that IPM program in some local government units are still running and we are communicating in a way for them. So that's me, Wilma, thank you. Okay, thanks Wilma, happy to have you on the panel with your vast experience. Uh, Fiorak from Cambodia, can you introduce yourself? Okay. Maybe he's not there yet. I see Chris. I mean, we heard you already. Can you maybe add a few things that you would like to share um, with the panelists? Chris? Oh, yeah. very, very, maybe very short. So I'm Chris Vekers. I'm from Belgium. Uh, yeah, from the other side of, of, of the world. I'm an agricultural engineer and an entomologist. Um, I, uh, I'm based in Vietnam. Uh, I uh, work as a private consultant. I have my own consulting firm, one man consulting firm. Um, I also work as a honorary associate professor with University of Queensland. I'm a guest professor at IPP CAS in Beijing. And I'm a scholar at another uh, Chinese un university. And I work together with many different governments here in the in the Southeast Asia region on integrated pest management, on biological control, on biodiversity friendly farming, on many different ways to safeguard the environment and improve uh, farmer livelihoods. That's it. <laughs> okay, thanks Chris. Glad to have you too. Andrew, can we hear you? Please introduce Hi. yourself. Hi, Marian. Um, I'm Hi. sitting here in <laughs> I'm sitting here in Ventian. Um, I work for Helvetus now. Um, I'm the team leader for something called the Lao Upland Rural Advisory Service. Um, I've been working in Southeast Asia for nearly 40 years, um, and including time with FAO, as you know. Um, okay. Please yeah. to meet Great everybody. to have you too. Yeah. Thank you so much for contributing. Then I still try once more Chin Fiarik, probably I mispronounced your name from Shmer, Shmer, Khmer, Cambodia. Can you also please introduce yourself? Okay, I maybe the colleagues from TAF can try to contact Chin and then maybe we try to get him on later. I think it's better that we, we start. There is a number of questions and I will not ask uh, all of you to answer each question in detail, but I will tell whom I would like to respond to a question. And if uh, the audience has additional questions, please put them in the Q&A and we might be able to come back to them later. Um, the first question, I think one of the things that came up in the questionnaire was how do you deal with farmer training in times of a COVID pandemic? Um, I think a lot of our training strategies are based on being in the field with farmers, working in groups, exchanging knowledge, ex De developing skills, having, you know, the capacity to critically analyze a complex ecosystem to come to good decisions. Um, when you can't have, um, you know, face-to-face -face meetings over time 
um, you are forced to go to online training methods, you know, how do you do that? What experiences do you have combining field training, online training to develop the critical skills of farmers? What, you know, what are the challenges that you have found and how do you find the right kind of mix of field-based and online learning? I would like to ask Andrew, Wilma and Firak from Schmerkmer to respond to those questions. Wilma, can you start? So actually, our experience in the Philippines uh, before is face-to-face -face training. So I am not used to that online. So now that we have the FAO Technical Cooperation Program, we still use the face-to-face -face because as per our observation with the farmers, our farmers are already old. So they are not technology learned and educated. So it's hard for us to use the, uh, the online method. But uh, as we go on, maybe, and we are discussing with each other, we will have some portion of the farmer school that will be using online because the setup of the farmer school in the Philippines is we have ISA, then we have the uh, group dynamics, and we have the special topics. So in ISA, we are monitoring, we are in the field monitoring and seeing the condition of the plants in the field where we see the natural enemies in the pest. Then for the group dynamics, we are using some exercises so that these farmers will have a strong relationship with each other together with their facilitators. Then for the special topics, these are the topics being asked by the farmer. This is the problem they have in their own field. So I think we can use the online method of training the farmers. But we need, although we will be using this online, we need also to have the farmers see what is actually happening in the field. It's not 100% for the special topic. Then for the whole farmer from school, I think uh, it's only about 20% that we can use the online method, only in the special topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Wilma. Andrew, can we hear your thinking about this issue? Well, Laos was pretty lucky when it came to COVID. Um, we had very few positive cases in the country. Um, um, and the period of lockdown was relatively short. Uh, and it happened during a, a time of the year when farmers have their annual New Year holidays. And so it didn't interfere too much with field activities. However, as you know, Laos is a, is a low population density. And so getting people together for face-to-face -face training is always difficult. Um, and we have uh, found that using social media has been very effective uh, in support of action research. Um, so people who are geographically separated um, can come together in a community of practice um, and using apps like WhatsApp, they're able to um, share photos, video clips, you know, with an immediate response from their peers who may be, you know, in villages many miles away. So the use of uh, communities of practice, these are small groups. I mean, we're talking about 10, 20 people in a WhatsApp group, but the fact that it's small, um, sort of recreates that, that um, atmosphere of a, of a farmer field school. I mean, obviously it's not ideal, but you've got a small group of people who are confident enough to be able to share information about what's going on in their fields, um, ask questions of each other, you know, give each other a confidence boost, um, and, you know, also interact with a, a, an external expert, an entomologist, for example. So we've, we've, we've had some pretty positive experience using WhatsApp for the action research related to fall armyworm. 
Okay, that's very interesting. Let me see if we also can get a response from Shra Kumar. I think that still doesn't seem to be working. I think, you know, you raised some inter Billman, Andrew. I think you have some interesting reflections on how you could use um, particularly small uh, group networking and social media to still have a kind of face-to-face -face contact, a group trust that's there, that develops and that talks around field-based action work. And I think that's something that maybe also next session when we are talking about developing uh, training strategies would be a very important consideration. I think next uh, session, there will also be a bit more reflection and experience on uh, learning videos and stimulating farmers through videos to go and, you know, do self-discovery and learn about particular topics. So I think this whole discussion on online learning, pharma field schools, field-based learning, finding the right mixes, maybe in times of COVID is more urgent, but I think it's an ongoing discussion. And last word is not said about that one. Um, I think we, it seems we have contract with um, Sher Khmer Firak Chin now. So if so, Firak, you have any, anything to add on online learning and field-based learning? Okay, I think there's still some issue, but I suggest we move to a second question that came out of the questionnaires. And that's basically linked to um, adapting learning curricula and, and learning activities to a particular socioeconomic context and ecological context. And I think in the different countries, there are farmers that grow maize, but maybe with different purposes, with different places in their farming systems. They might be commercial farmers. They might be growing maize for their own food production. There's also farmers that are already dealing with, you know, heavy infestation of fall armyworm and maybe seeing it for the first time. There is farmers that are dreading or waiting for fall army warm to come. And there is farmers that know that fall army warm is there to stay and it's not going to go away. And, you know, how do you deal with, with kind of adapting field school learning and, and training programs to the situation? What, what did you consider? And I would like to address this question to Chris and Andrew. Maybe Chris, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I have a whole list of, of, of points, so I'll, I'll go step by step. Uh, uh, so first of all, I think we all need to consider that fall army worm is, a, is an invasive pest. Eh? It's, it's something new. It's, it's something uh, f farmers are not familiar with. It's a new shock in their uh, uh, cropping systems. Farmers may be alarmed by, their, uh, by its voracious uh, a feeding, it presents, basically the pest uh, represents a potential contributor to yield loss, a loss of revenue, a loss of farmer income. So it can present a threat to their livelihood, livelihoods, uh, a, a potential loss of in investment. It can maybe exacerbate the uh, uh, poverty vul vulnerability, the risk of hunger. So many of farmers' decisions, farmers' actions are aimed at assessing how important of a risk uh, this is, uh, anticipating the, the magnitude of pest-induced uh, crop losses, and ultimately at removing uh, that, that risk. And farmers' decisions will be based on four, four different elements. Uh, element number one is the knowledge of the pest. Uh, element number two is the the knowledge of the agroecological dynamics. Uh, element number three is the familiarity or a farmer's experience with different control strategies. And element number four is the perceived susceptibility to uh, certain pest-related uh, uh, risks. For element number one, uh, the pest itself, many farmers here in Southeast Asia 
I, and I think maybe across the globe, they tend to overestimate pest impacts. If you talk to a rice grower here in Vietnam, or if you talk to a maize grower in, in, uh, in, in, in Thailand, some farmers will tell you, oh, fall army worm, it's coming to my field. It's, uh, it, uh, it's, it's yeah, pre uh, presenting uh, extensive foliage uh, feeding. This is gonna be 100% yield loss. I will be broke to, uh, I'll be broke at the time of, of harvest. This pest is, is, is a huge threat to, to me. Uh, second element, ecological balance, ecological, agroecological dynamics. Farmers tend to have limited or even no knowledge about uh, uh, certain ecosystem services, such as bio biological control. Um, we have run a, a, a study uh, two years ago in which we looked at uh, published records of farmer knowledge, and we found that on average farmers across the globe, they know one natural enemy. And those natural enemies that they know, they tend to be diurnal, so they active, uh, large-bodied predators, such as social wasps, uh, sp spiders, and may maybe ants. 70% of the farmers globally, they don't know about biological control and they don't believe in it. Uh, so this shapes farmers' uh, de decisions as well. Uh, uh, the third element is fa familiarity uh, with different control strategies. Many farmers are very familiar with pesticide use. Sometimes you talk to farmers in, in, in Central America and they consider uh, pesticides as medicine. This is medicine. Just like you go to the doctor, uh, uh, farmers go to the agrochemical supply, supply shop to buy med medicine. Yeah, pesticides are omnipresent here in the countryside. They are sold over the counter. Uh, sometimes highly hazardous pro products are sold over the counter in small sachets. They can trial use them. Yeah, you can buy a little package for half a dollar. You spray it in a corner of your field and, and it's easy to, to know whether or not, not it works. Uh, farmers may, may know the risk that certain pesticides present to human health, but they tend to dis disregard them, they, to, to downplay uh, the, the, those risks. Um, and then element number four is the susceptibility or the perceived susceptibility uh, uh, of their uh, uh, cropping systems to pest-related ri ri risks. So small-scale resource-poor farmers may perceive a higher susceptibility to pest attack uh, than uh, large-scale rich uh, growers. In the meantime, small-scale producers with with diverse cropping systems, they may also have a lower risk to a pest that is confined to one specific crop yeah? because they diversify their crops. They grow maize, they grow beans, they grow cacao, they grow coffee. Uh, so they, they may be able to buffer some of those uh, 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 impacts of alarmy worm in, in the maize crop. Now, how can we shape, how can we modify uh, th those decisions? I think we can modify those decisions in, in many different ways. Uh, for the pest itself, I think it would be very good to, to, to do participatory assessment of yield loss, of economic impact with different farmer groups, yeah? through farmer field schools. And I think there's a lot of experience here in the region with farmer field schools. So why don't we go to the field and with different groups of farmers, we actually measure yield loss and, and, and economic impact. Ecological balance, I think there, again, we, we can draw uh, on, on the experiences with farmer field schools. Seeing is believing, uh, yeah? You can go, you go with the farmer to, to the field, observe the natural enemies, yeah? Those sting bugs that, that Pio Pan talked about, uh, those, uh, those earwigs that the Thai team showed, yeah? Very important for farmers to observe those processes, to see them attack the, the, the caterpillar, and then ultimately, or hopefully, uh, believe in, in, in biological control. On familiarity, on the third element, I think it would be excellent to, to facilitate trial use of, best, of pesticides, or, or, or not of pesticides, of biopesticides, sorry, uh, facilitate trial use of, of biopesticides, run demonstrations of, of NPV, 
just like Tim showed that uh, the, the, the NPV in, in the work with NPV in Bangladesh, I think uh, if, if one can facilitate uh, demonstrations, that would be e excellent. And on susceptibility um, of farmers to, to pest attack, one can remove that susceptibility by innovative finance mechanisms, yeah? By crop insurance through mutual funds, by uh, maybe tying loan re repairment to farmers safeguarding of ecological resilience in, in, in their systems. I, 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 I think if one can do that, that would be wonderful. Then, what else do farmers need? Farmers need information, yeah? Farmers, uh, what farmers do not know cannot help them. Uh, one's a, a, a famous uh, anthropologist said. So if farmers don't know the solutions, they cannot use them. So we have to provide those solutions or the underlying agroecological principles and con concepts. Uh, we need to tailor those to certain crop typologies, yeah? either large scale production systems where farmers may be inclined to use, I don't know, seed treatments or drone sprays, as well as to smallholder subsistence uh, farming systems. And we need to accompany uh, uh, that, uh, that information with appropriate policies uh, uh, at, at the government level. Um, and then maybe as a final comment, I, I really uh, like the work of, of uh, uh, K.L. Young, uh, the former ent entomologist at, at IRI, uh, who tirelessly worked on, on promoting IPM and biological control for the past 30 years. Um, and he always put emphasis on simple and easy to understand uh, uh, message, messaging to farmers using heuristics, simple decision rules. Yeah? And IRI has a number of simple decision rules for pest management in rice, uh, three uh, gains, uh, uh, three reductions, three gains, no early spray. Uh, um, uh, K.L. Hyung always talked about the small bees uh, instead of parasitic wasps, which farmers couldn't see and, 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 and understand. So he talked about small bees. So easy and simple messages, yeah? Keep it simple. Yeah, that's okay, it, too much. <laughs> no, I think it's a very exhaustive answer. And I would like to ask Andrew whether he can still add something to all the things that Chris already mentioned, also from a Lao perspective. Well, from our context, I will uh, certainly agree with some of what Chris has said, but I may disagree with others. I, I mean, when, when fall armyworm first arrived uh, in Laos, in the, the program I worked for, we immediately um, launched a pro an information program. We took generic information from CIMIT, from FAO, had it translated, printed it, made videos, pushed it out. And at the same time, um, we launched a program of action research, participatory action research, similar to Farmer Field School, but um, really on a small scale, um, given the number of options that we were testing. You know, we're not trying to compare one or two treatments. As Dr. Piopan has already mentioned, there's a list there of about 12 different things that have been mm -hmm. tested. And over the course of three seasons, um, they've narrowed it down a bit um, <laughs> into what seems to work better than others. But you know, I, at this point, I'm not optimistic about the use of farmer field schools at scale to deal with fall armyworm in Laos. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, this is what I would call a transitional crop. You know, this is not, for most farmers in Laos, they were not growing maize uh, 20 years ago, and they will not be growing it in another 20 years. Um, this has come in, there's been a maize boom in order to supply huge animal feed, you know, companies across the border. This is, most maize is not for human local consumption. And as a transitional cost, it's very low intensity. Farmers spray herbicides to clear land, they plant the seed, and then they go away and take care of other crops until they come back and harvest this, and then they cash it in. Um, so, 
they're not prepared to invest the amount of time or money uh, that I think is required for a good IPM farmer field score. Um, they're, not, they're not putting fertilizers on this crop. Um, they are not using irrigation on this crop. This is not rice as a special food crop, and this is not vegetables, which has a higher return per unit labor or per unit land. So I think if you're growing this low intensity maize for animal feed, you want some very simple responses. And yeah, we can continue to push out extension messages. I mean, I hate saying that as a person who's a real fan of the farmer field school, but maybe based on the participatory action research of the last 18 months, we can refine the messages. Um, but it is going to have to be simple um, if farmers are going to take any notice whatsoever. And as I said, you know, they're actually, <laughs> well, let's put this a different way. You know, for these farmers, the best control method for fall armyworm is don't grow maize, right? A lot of them are already transitioning out of maize because of declining yields, soil fertility losses, and if, they, if they're suffering a 10% yield loss, it will just speed up the transition out of maize into more profitable crops. So yeah, maybe there's certain parts of the country where um, sweet corn is being grown, you know, it has a higher value, um, local market, you know, food crop. Maybe there, there are small groups of people who would, who who really want to find sustain, you know, ways of sustaining their, their production. But I think for most of the farmers producing animal feed for export, you know, then they're not going to invest in the complex set of arrangements that's needed, you know, combining, you know, all this agroecological, the biocontrol, the botanicals, um, you know, thinking about the timing of planting and, uh, you know, all these different complex things. I, I don't see that happening. So mm. simple messages. Yes, good idea. Um, farmer field schools at scale. Mm, I'm not convinced it's going to happen in Laos. Yeah. Okay, I think, you know, both Andrew and Chris give some real interesting thoughts that we also should consider when developing training strategies and understand what, you know, maize, what the role of maize is in a system and whether farmers might be better off growing something else altogether. Um, I think the bottom line is that when an invasive species arrive, as we also saw from the questionnaires, the first response is still grab the pesticides at farmer level, but I think also systems tend to do that. And I think, you know, helping farmers understand depending on what are growing, are there alternative crops? If I stay with maize, what do I need to do to understand the agroecology, understand that you deal with complex knowledge? I think that can be investments of field schools, maybe combined with some online learning, but also then trying to find the simple messages. I think there is maybe, as Chris talked about last week, but I think we also see some of that already happening. When the fall army worm arrives, it might be, you know, a scared, reaction of pesticides, but then already existing biocontrol kicks in and maybe a second year already infestations go down. So I think that's some of the scenarios we need to consider also when we develop training. I think we don't have real answers, but we have some, you know, additional factors to consider that go outside the biology and the ecology and the IPM, but also look at socioeconomic, political, uh, situation. Um, good. Um, I have one more question already prepared. If people have additional questions for the panelists after the upcoming question, then please pose them on the Q&A. Um, I think maybe some of this has been addressed already quite 
uh, in detail, but it links to what are gaps in biocontrol and IPM and make it work for farmers. And I think we touched a bit upon that. There might be technical ecological issues, but it, we might also deal with access, availability of certain control uh, methods, the right reliability, the mindset of people, but also policy contacts. And I would like to ask Wilma and Chris to share some of their thinking on, you know, these issues, the gaps in biocontrol, IPM, and how to make it work. So Wilma, can you take that question as a first? Okay, yes. Uh, you know, Marion, we were not able to sustain that interest of our farmers in biological control. Before, they mm. are very interested in biological control. But, uh, Maybe because we were not able to institutionalize our program before, the IPM program. So after some time, we lost the funding. So we lost the, uh, how do you call that? We lost the interest of the farmers. So I think uh, uh, with the current fall, fall army worm problem, I think we need to revive the biological control in the farmer in school. So because the powerful school in the Philippines is participatory, experiential, and discovery-based. So when it is participatory, more farmers are encouraged to join uh, a certain activity, especially when they see that they are also the lead in that group. We are not uh, having trainers, student uh, participation, but it is... Uh, as if everybody is expert on that topic. So also more farmers are more on experiential. What they see is what they believe. So I think with that uh, aspect, we can show to the farmers how biocontrol is working. And also their, the presence of natural enemies in the field. If they see that there are some uh, queries on some uh, stages of insects, they can see, they can collect it in the farmer field school and have, them, uh, and have them see what will happen to that insect. So that's discovery. So if they saw that uh, uh, a certain insect is eating uh, a certain organism, then I think it will help for them to appreciate biological control. Also, there is a lot of uh, supplies in the Philippines uh, of biological control agents because biopesticides registration is very few. So we need that. There are more inorganic chemicals registered here in the Philippines. So we, are, we have started already the village type rearing of biological control. So these are simple rearing techniques that farmers can reuse. So we have started it, but uh, due to some lack of funding, we were not able to continue it. So when they see that there is no more funding, because some were, have uh, made it into business, some little co-ops, but they cannot survive because of some other resources that they need in, in their very type laboratory. So with this uh, farmer field school, I think it will help much and reviving the interest of the farmers in biological control. And I hope also that uh, uh, the government will support it and uh, promote it to the farmers. Okay, thanks Wilma. Chris? Yeah. Um, so yeah, on, on, on biological control, I, I was very excited to, to hear all the, the presentations th this afternoon. At, uh, uh, so we got uh, earwigs there, we got sting bugs, we got uh, uh, Bovaria metarisium, uh, we got trichogramma, we got telenom telenomus. We have many different natural enemies that are already being used. Uh, I think this is exciting, but I would say bring it on. There's much more uh, uh, to be done on, on, on bio, biological control. Um, some clear gaps and, and opportunities to grow. I, I organized them in, in three uh, different, uh, under three different bullets. So one conservation biological control, a second one augmentation biological control, 
and then a, a transversal a bullet that also touches upon some, some opportunities in, in IPM. So on conservation, biological control, I think there's a lot of work uh, that, that uh, <coughs> waits to be done. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, I think we need to do more to discover, to identify uh, natural enemies that occur in, in farmers' fields. Uh, I just uh, ran a quick literature search before, before the, the Zoom call and I, I learned, for example, 20 years ago in Papua New Guinea maize fields, 60% uh, of, of the invertebrates that occur in those uh, fields are ants, predatory ants, and 32% of the, the invertebrates that, that are found in, in Papua New Guinea maize fields are spiders. I think what's, what's in Papua New Guinea maize, maize fields may be fairly similar to what's in maize fields in Vietnam, in Thailand, or in Indonesia. Uh, yet nobody is working on the ants, yeah? And ants may very well be the, the most abundant and maybe most voracious predator in tropical agroecosystems. Nobody's doing any work on ants. Ants go after the pupae, ants go after the larvae, and maybe ants also go after the egg masses, uh, or some ants go after the egg masses. Uh, same with social wasps, same with spiders. So we need to we need to look at what we have, uh, look at what is present in in the maize fields, and look what contribution those natural enemies can make. One to pro and then what are the opportunities for biological control? Yeah, to protect them, and or to provide additional resources. They could be with feeding stations, uh, uh, providing them sugar uh, or pollen re resources, alternative uh, host and prey items. Um, communicate that knowledge to, to, yeah, don't only just do research for research sake, uh, but also communicate the findings to, to the growers, even uh, uh, basic ecological information such as ants like sugar and ants eat fall army worm uh, can trigger farmer experimentation and can stimulate farmer innov innovations. Um, Communicate that, that uh, information in the same way as in Vietnam, the use of flower strips uh, in rice systems has been promoted. Yeah? Many farmers in southern Vietnam right now are establishing flower strips to uh, boost biological control in rice systems. And why? Because those flowers, they provide nectar uh, re resources uh, to foraging parasitoids. So they bolster biological control. Yeah? Um, on conservation biological control, I think it's also important to, to run the economics, yeah, to actually measure what is the economic impact of, of, of biological control in those systems. If farmers are reframed from pesticide use, how much money do they basically yeah, uh, 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 yeah, earn or, or, or uh, don't lose, in, 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 in fact? Um, maybe measure some of here in the Asia region, not only for maize, but maybe also measure some of the contributions of biological control to human health, uh, maybe to decarbonization of the system, uh, uh, yeah, to, to reduced use of external inputs. Um, so all these are exercises that, that wait to be done. On augmentation biological control, so again, many uh, exciting experiences already in, in Southeast Asia with trichogramma, with telenomus, uh, with the sting bugs. Um, but here I think it's, uh, it's important to ask the question, well, what natural enemies are we going to rear? Why are we going to rear those? Are those the most effective na natural enemies? Uh, 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 should they be native uh, species or exotic? Because I think some institutions are looking at e exotics as well. Should they be parasitoids or, pre or predators? Yeah, many questions need to, need to be asked there. On availability, I, I think a very important, and, and uh, Tim also emphasized that, is to fast track registration of bi biopesticides. And what Tim was able to accomplish in Bangladesh to get a registration for uh, NPV, and I think for a, a, a one of the fungal sprays in nine months, I think this is mar marvelous. All countries should take that as, a, as an example. 
once certain agents are available in a given country, uh, one can pursue two roads, uh, either through government-run programs in which those, those products are, 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 are being produced and distributed to farmers, or through the stimulation of cottage-style family businesses. And there's a huge opportunities for cottage-style production of metarisium, trico, trichoderma, trichogramma, Many different biological control agents can be produced at a, 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 in an effective way by small holders in, uh, in rural areas. Um, um, I think that addresses access as well. Access is another issue, access to biological con control ag agents. Um, Tim already addressed that a little, a little bit, storage issues, uh, loss of quality, uh, um, uh, 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 maintenance in, 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 in a freezer. Um, so th those is issues need to be addressed, quality control as well in terms of species identity, uh, sex ratio fitness. Um, and then sharing the experiences with augmentative biological control uh, through video. I think there's a huge opportunity uh, to use video, farmer to farmer, educational video to upscale uh, bi biological control. Then on the third uh, bullet point on, on the transversal uh, uh, topics and on, on the opportunities to promote uh, biological control within IPM, I have a couple of elements as well. So one way is to push biological control, yeah? to push through either incentives that the government provides, uh, outcome-based uh, rewards. And there one nice example is the Dutch uh, uh, Delta plan for the biodiversity in which the government basically rewards the farmers that protect biodiversity. I think this is a marvelous example, maybe feasible in some countries, maybe not, not in others. Um, favorable credit schemes and loan repayments for farmers that adopt biological control. Yeah? Pest insurance uh, schemes yeah? in which farmers, they, instead of paying the agrochemical supplier to buy pe by buying pesticides, is to put their money in a, in a, uh, a community-based uh, mutual fund in which the money goes to IPM extension or to biological control extension. Yeah? This type of work exists. Yeah? In Italy, this is very successful among maize producers. Yeah? Yeah? So farmers don't, uh, in, don't use their money to buy pesticides. Instead, they, they, they promote uh, or, or they facilitate uh, ex extension schemes at the community level. Yeah? So one way uh, to pushing biological control is by providing rewards. Another way is by punishing. Yeah? But the, the government can punish, can, can restrict the use of, of certain products, uh, can ban uh, certain products. Uh, then an, another opportunity, aside from pushing, is pulling, is creating demand-driven uh, uh, opportunities for biological control in which the consumers, they demand healthy, pesticide-free products, yeah, in, in which they mm. develop full biological yeah. control. Yeah, so yeah. that's it a little bit. There's uh, many opportunities. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think, you know, based on the responses, the feedback from you and Wilma, it's very clear that there is such an enormous potential to really change the way we think about agriculture and, and biocontrol and IPM. And I think what is most important is to change the mindset of people that things really can be different. And uh, you know, I think that was a challenge 30, 40 years ago, and it's probably even a bigger challenge, despite all the progress made in, in, in IPM, in agroecology whatsoever, it seems that problems related to overuse of pesticides are only increasing. And I think we all need to continue to, to reflect, to discuss, and to, to develop strategies to try to finally, you know, 
make a difference. Um, I think that is not an easy job, but what has never been, and it's still a difficult job. Um, I think there's maybe a few questions that are very technical. And since we're running out of time, maybe I think there's a few questions addressed to Wilma. Wilma, could you just try to type in the answer? Because I think, you know, we don't have that much time anymore. Um, oh. Is that okay, Wilma? Can you do that? Yes, Because we have another eight minutes to wrap up. And I think next week you will also be with us. I, next session, not next week. You will also be with us. So we could still come back. Um, sorry that we didn't manage to connect with our panelists from Shmer, Sher Khmer in Cambodia. I hope he will be there next week. So maybe he can then share some of the experiences. From my point of view, I would really like to thank uh, Vilma, Chris and Andrew very much for sharing their experiences and their thoughts. And I think it will help um, participants in the next session to shape up training strategies. And I think it also will contribute to some bigger thinking that we need to continue to do. Um, thank you very much. I will now hand back to Jan for wrap up closing remarks and links to the next session. Thanks uh, Marion for a great uh, panel discussion. Um, I think it helped us mm -hmm. enlighten some of the issues that we've been discussing through the presentations uh, on day one and day two. This uh, webinar session, we've been particularly focusing on um, getting the Fall strategies and action plans implemented into the field and used by farmers. And we've seen basically that the plans are in place, the biocontrol options seem to be effective and working and increasingly becoming available to farmers. So how do we get best farmers to make use of it? How do we get them best to make use of all these wonderful novel options becoming available to manage full armyworm in their own fields from an ecological perspective, putting biocontrol first. Now, from the uh, presentations and the panel discussions, I picked up on what I think are some six important uh, issues, challenges, issues identified in the discussions, presentations and discussions that we need to keep in mind as home take uh, take home messages and that we need to come back on uh, during the final third session when we start to talk particularly about training strategies and activities and thinking about what is it specifically that we need to make sure gets integrated into our training activities in terms of curricula and support learning materials to address these challenges and, and issues. So as a first point, I want to reconnect us to uh, what I think was a very important uh, analysis point that Chris made from his um, presentation on the questionnaire responses, the analysis, keeping in mind that if you design an IPM approach for fall management in your own countries and in your own localities, keep in mind the pyramid uh, shape of the design making sure it is based on a range of uh, alt uh, alternatives to pesticides, putting ecological approaches and, and cultural approaches first before you think about uh, pesticide use. So keeping that uh, pyramid design central in your uh, IPM design and interventions is of very crucial importance. And all countries need to take this, this serious in terms of their uh, IPM design processes. Then we have seen, um, particularly during session one, but also uh, in session uh, two today, that there are so many biocontrol options available these days, and increasingly these become available um, through private sector action, but also through uh, enabling capacity building in communities to produce their own biological control agencies that um, we need to increase our emphasis on providing better access 
um, and that will also have implications for our action research and training programs that we will be discussing on the third day. What can we do to ensure farmers understand uh, what's available, how it works, and enable them to make use of these great options? And as Chris mentioned also in his last comments, uh, speedy regulatory actions to uh, prioritize approvals for biocontrol products like NPVs is of vital importance in this sense. A third point, um, if in the cases countries or localities decide that it, farmers decide that it is still important to keep pesticide as part as a last resort option, be very critical in terms of what you're advising farmers to use. Make sure that absolutely there are no highly hazardous pesticides on your list of uh, products that you advise. And uh, keep in mind that very important advice that Jepson, um, Paul Jepson put out in his recent publications um, and that came back in the advice uh, and analysis shared by, by Chris if you do choose pesticides, make sure that you understand what you're using, what the impact is on the environment and on the health, and try to minimize that impact. And I think regulatory systems um, in the various countries have a very important vital role to play in that analysis and, and what they advise and make available to, to farmers. Then a fourth uh, point uh, that particularly was elaborated on uh, in the panel discussions, the use of simple messages through social media versus more intensive approaches like farmer field schools, both have their relevance and importance in reaching out to farmers. Uh, it depends very much, as Andrew mentioned as well, on the sort of production systems that you're working with. Uh, so when we talk about training and capacity building uh, activities uh, in the third session, we need to keep that in mind. We need to have a proper mix of um, social media use, digital options um, versus more intensive face-to-face -face type of training modalities like farmer fit schools, particularly in these times of uh, COVID-19. So that's an important point to keep in mind also for the, for the third session. A fifth uh, message I think that remains uh, important as it ever was, as we have been promoting IPM over the last uh, many decades, making sure farmers can make good management decisions based on informed decision making uh, by understanding ecology and by understanding and being able to recognize natural enemies in your own fields and making them work for you and being able as a farmer to do a good agroecosystem analysis by going into your field, uh, informing yourselves and making the right IPM based decisions. That remains as important as ever. And that also needs to come back therefore in the Friday discussions when we talk about training, what do we need to do to reinforce that capacity of farmers and communities to understand ecology and make informed decisions. Finally, an important point also is to think about, uh, particularly in these times of COVID-19, what do we need to do to ensure that farmers um, become uh, skilled in using social media and other uh, ITC options. So digital literacy skills training, I think are of vital importance. Um, that feeds, uh, connects back also to observations that Wilma made Many of our farmers, that's not just the Philippines, but it's around the region, are um, an elder generation. What do we need to do to ensure they master digital uh, literacy and that they can connect to that wealth of information and advice that is available online so that we can help them make better informed decisions? So. Digital literacy skills training, I think, also needs to come back in our um, third and last session of this webinar. Talking about that, uh, Friday will therefore be our last uh, session uh, as part of this webinar series on full army worm and, and training for the Asia Pacific region. 
And um, that session will be moderated by Dada. We'll have some, uh, a couple of speakers lined up. Um, um, Anna Safi from uh, headquarters to talk about farmer field schools and the global field school platform and what we can do to help farmers manage uh, full army worms from an ecological perspective. But also Paul von Mele will be joining us uh, to talk about digital technologies and use the videos for uh, as part of training programs. Uh, and after that, we will go into a very participatory um, uh, way of discussing a range of issues. And uh, Dada Abubakar uh, will lead us into that process before we finalize this webinar uh, with uh, some thinking uh, about moving forward. Uh, what do we do with all this, all this knowledge, all this information and knowledge, and how do we put things into practice to help our farmers um, and our countries implement their uh, full army worm action plans and training capacity programs more on top of what we what they're doing already and on top of what we have discussed during this um, this webinar session so far so with that um, i'd like to thank all of the speakers uh, all of the panelists uh, today for their um, uh, participation their, for their delivery of their presentations and great inputs and we did like to thank also all participants uh, of this session for their active participation and listening in on this webinar. We hope it has been useful. We do appreciate if you provide feedback. Uh, we keep the chat box open for at least another 15 minutes or so, so that you can provide feedback. Please do that. It helps us understand on whether you think this, this uh, webinar has been useful so far and what particular you have found uh, interesting. Um, and with that, um, we would like to say goodbye for today and see you back hopefully on Friday. Um, don't, um, don't forget Friday, the next webinar session starting 1.30 Bangkok time. Uh, we hope to see all of you back. And that, I did like to close and uh, looking forward to uh, the ne next and final session on Friday, hoping to see you all back. Thank you very much. Welcome back up.